It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, homecoming. More hostages, including an American child, released by Hamas. It's such a relief for them just to see them smiling and to see them reunited. Straight ahead, new details on what's next amid a push to extend the ceasefire. Then, sideline heroes. We'll introduce you to the Baltimore Ravens' unlikely stars. Welcome to the heart of our fireman operation for the Ravens. The firefighters who provide all types of support behind the scenes. We all have to jump in there for that one, whether it be here or at the firehouse. By fighting fires on and off the field. Plus, it's on. Jill is here with the steals and deals to make the most of Cyber Monday, with the holiday shopping season officially underway. And Eras and Eddie. Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross talk to Al about their new holiday movie and Eddie's iconic career. Should we list the career? Do we just want to? Do we want to? Y'all can. Do we want to start at the beginning? I don't know. There was red hours, leather. Hours, there was yeah. a stage. Red, red leather. There was. Uh, there was. There a, was also purple leather. Then there was yeah. an SNL <laughs> stage. There was. There was. Uh, there was so many things. Plus, an exclusive announcement from Taylor Swift about her concert film that shattered records. Welcome to the Eras Tour. We've got it all today, Monday, November 27th, 2023. On a mother-daughter trip to celebrate our graduation from Oviedo, Florida. To Glenthora, California. Celebrating Hayden's 22nd birthday. Hi to my cousin, Sadie and Jude. In Hanover, Pennsylvania. Happy Monday. From Lancaster, Texas. Dardanelle, Arkansas. St. Michael, Minnesota. California. Yeah. Shout out to our hometown, population 29 in Nato, Missouri. Here to surprise my mom, a Today Show super fan. Watching in Beaverton, Michigan. We love you. Woo! We are back with our special series inside the game. As we just showed you, the Baltimore Ravens picked up a big win, diffusing the no longer San Diego L.A. Chargers on Sunday Night Football. Okay, here's something you may not know about the Ravens. They have a secret weapon that no other NFL team has. You know who knows? NBC's Kaylee Hartung. She rolled up her sleeves for this one. Hey, Kaylee. How oh, I did. Just wait for this. Okay. As the saying goes, right? Not all heroes wear capes. So if you were watching the Ravens last night, you might not have recognized the hardworking heroes supporting the team on the sidelines. An elite group that is always ready to serve. In the city of Baltimore, these heroes are working double duty. When you guys first became firefighters, did you ever imagine the role that the Ravens could come to play in your life? No, not at no, all. Not at all. David Kamak, Frank Thomas, and Jawan Yancey are three of 23 Baltimore firefighters who work part-time for the Ravens support team on their days off from the firehouse. How similar is the mentality that it takes to be a firefighter? What's required of this job? I think it, run, it runs hand in hand. No one's bigger than the team. It's all a group effort. So we all have to jump in there for that win, whether it be here or at the firehouse. The tradition started in 1996, when the Baltimore Ravens franchise first began. The team didn't have a huge budget to hire full-time employees, so local firefighters volunteered to help. And 26 years later, they've never left. In a week, how long is the list of to-dos for you guys here? How long do we have? <laughs> yeah. Starts from 6 a.m. up to 8.30 at night some nights. Welcome to the heart of our fireman operations for the Ravens. This is where we do all the laundry, game days, and practices. We have some game day pants here. We go dig into, we get right to work. We got a blood stain remover. We got blood, we got grass stains. Not to mention the sweat. I'm trying not to get too close. Yeah. Whose uh, pants are these? So this is uh, Ben Cleveland. He's our, one of our tackles, massive man. Ben Cleveland, you're welcome. The guys say on a white yeah, pants week, it's a seven step process to get them clean. Roquan Smith, heart and soul of the defense, and some of the dirtiest pants in this pile. <laughs> What's a tougher assignment? Putting out a fire or getting the stains out of some of those dirty uniforms? I would definitely say the stains. <laughs> <laughs> On Sunday night in Los Angeles, those Ravens uniforms were looking crisp. The firefighters side by side with the players at SoFi Stadium wrestling the players' gear on and shagging practice balls moments before kickoff. 
and the morning after a game, they're right back at the firehouse. By the way, that man who was helping me with the laundry, Jawan Yancey, he's chief of his firehouse. What's your favorite part about getting to be a part of the Ravens organization? Not to sound sappy, but like these guys. It's kind of like a deep breath for us when you get to hang out with your friends and your favorite team. And Chief Yancey is one of the only Raven staff members entrusted with this job, breaking in the footballs for the most accurate kicker in NFL history, Justin Tucker. You take the end of the brush and you want to get all the nubs off the football. Smooth it out. Yep, you want a smooth kicking surface. Lucky for you, Justin Tucker doesn't really miss. Yeah. Yeah, well, boy, I probably wouldn't have a job. You have played a very important role in that through his career. A small part. He I'm works hard. Nervous. He works hard. The Ravens players know the sacrifice these firefighters make for their city and how valuable they are to this team. Patrick Queen is one of the Ravens' fiercest linebackers. Everything they do for us is just it's so greatly appreciated. I mean, like, this place really wouldn't be functioning the way it functions without them. Do you have any idea how long it takes them to get grass stains and blood stains out of your uniform after a game? I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure it's a long time. How cool is that for you guys just to be surrounded by men of this caliber? Well, one thing, if the building catch on fire, I know who to go to for one. <laughs> <laughs> so, firefighters have a motto, never say no. How does that apply here? We pride ourselves on fixing the problem and helping out. Situation comes comes along, we just, you know, shift gears and go in that motion, go in that direction. And these Baltimore firefighters are always ready to serve their city, saving the day on the field and saving lives off of it. And guys, Frank Thomas is the veteran of the group. He has been a firefighter for 34 years with the Ravens for 15 seasons, and he described the perspective they take so perfectly. He said firefighters don't have emergencies. The people we serve do. So we've got to keep it cool at all times. Yeah. I would say they are having a cooling influence on the Ravens. They look pretty good last Looks night. Looks like a laundry emergency in some of those. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I really had to put some, put yeah. some elbow grease yeah. into that. All the more sleep. reason to celebrate <laughs> the guys in the firehouse. Huh? Yeah. Those guys are making a cool. It's a cool job. I mean, they work hard, but how neat. They're part of the team. Absolutely. Yeah. They are. Those guys were on the road with them last night in Los Angeles, and some of them back in the firehouse tonight. Very cool. wow. We left some dirty laundry this. offset, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an expert now. Thank yeah. you. I think there's a young lady here with a bucket list item. What is your name? Sandy. Sandy? You want it? Should we take a picture together? Oh, I love that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's nobody Al, takes Al a better selfie. Hey, nobody takes a better self, selfie than, than Hoda. One. Hey! Oh, we got bucket you, Sandy. list. Boom! There you go. We got you. There you go. All right. We love Sandy. All right. Savannah, back to you. You need to, on the 10, talk about, with Hoda, why she's so good at that selfie. She's got a whole technique. She's perfected it. And she's we will really talk good. about that today. We're talking about it. But first, we have a new read with Jenna Pitt. Yes, can you believe it's our last pick of the year? I am so excited to share our December selection, and our crowd is going to help us. So let's count down. Ready? Three, two, two one. Maybe our crowd isn't going to help us. It is We Must Not Think of Ourselves by Lauren Grodstein. 
This is a poignant, beautiful novel. It's historical fiction. It's set in the Warsaw Ghetto right after World War II. The Nazis have taken over, and it is a poignant love story. It's about hope and resilience. We meet Adam, a teacher who starts to record all the stories of those that live there mm. so that they are never forgotten. Wow. And it is a book that proves that love remains even in the darkest corners. I hope y'all will read it with me. It is so beautiful. I think it is more timely than ever. I read this book over a year ago, wow. but obviously it's more timely than ever. So read with me. The book is in stores tomorrow and it's available to pre-order right now. Just head to your local indie bookstore or scan that QR code at the bottom of your screen and read with us. Buy it on Cyber Monday. Why not? Would it be fun? Cyber Monday? Yes. And, and support your indie bookstores. Yeah. All right, Jenna, thank you so much. Coming up next, we're going to take a trip to Candy Cane Lane. Al's fun chat with two legends. Joining forces for a new holiday movie, Eddie Murphy, Tracy Ellis Ross, and Al. But first, this is Today on NBC. Thanksgiving behind us. It is full steam ahead to Christmas. Of course, that means holiday movies, a new genre for two icons who, Al, you had a chance to sit down oh, with. Oh, man, this was such a blast, guys. I mean, Candy Cane Lane. It's a fun, festive film that brought together legendary Eddie Murphy with the one and only Tracy Ellis Ross, a dynamic duo on and off screen. All your questions are going to be answered. But when I show you this, don't freak out. When we're making the movie, we want to make a movie that people can watch over and over again. I think both Eddie and I put content in the world that has a lot of joy to it. Mm -hmm. And so a holiday movie sort of lends itself to that really easily. The intention of what we're doing is bringing people together. So it had all those pieces, those bits. Here, here. Here, here, here. In Candy Cane Lane, Eddie Murphy plays Chris Carver, a Christmas-obsessed dad who's down on his luck and trying to win a high-stake competition for best holiday decorations in the neighborhood. This is my wife, Carol. Hello. <laughs> Tracy Ellis Ross is Carol, Chris's wife, and mom to their three kids, Joy, Nick, and Holly. Named for the season, of course. Why did you want to do this together? Well, because I had seen, you know, the other stuff that she did. I was like, she's she's a comedian, you know. And when he says that, I really like it. I mean, obviously, what what made me? I mean, Eddie Murphy. Should we list the career? Do we just want to? Yeah, I mean, do we want to? Y'all can. Y'all can. Do we, <laughs> do we want to start at the beginning? I don't yeah. know. There was red hours, leather. Yeah. Yeah. There was yeah. a stage. Red, red leather. There was uh, there was. There a, was also purple leather. Then there was yeah. an SNL <laughs> stage. There was there was uh, there was so many things. <laughs> then there were movies. There were boomerangs. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, let's stop listening before we 
mention the flop. Okay, well, what? <laughs> <laughs> you keep, no, we you keep rattling them off. Eventually, you're going to say Pluto Nash. Eddie Murphy is Pluto Nash. <laughs> off screen, Eddie Murphy says he's going to be spending time with his kids this Christmas, while Tracy Ellis Ross is heading to her mom, Diana Ross's Holiday Haven. I read, in Tracy, that, that growing up, your your mom would ship a turkey to Switzerland? Oh, it Christmas? has happened, Al, yes. They don't have turkeys in Switzerland? Not the one she wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Not the one she so, wanted. So, you know, you gotta get you the gotta one you want. The right no, so here's the thing. Um, my mom clearly had a big career, has a big career and a sure. big life, and yeah. moved around a lot. And one of the things that my mom did with us is she created home wherever we were. What about you, Eddie? It's a, just a typical over the top, <laughs> <laughs> over the top Christmas. See, I got ten kids, so we have to do a, do a big, big wow. thing. Yeah, yeah. Ten children. That's my mom a, had five. Pretty, uh, pretty. This is a big house. A, and my young, my youngest is the same age as my granddaughter. My I got a son that's four. And my granddaughter. Is Eddie, four. that's extraordinary. Yeah, wow. Yes, that's an extraordinary. I'm, I'm quite the fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Our producer told me this. Your your son is dating Martin Lawrence's daughter. Yes. What? Yes. So, so that's so fascinating. Jasmine's always at the house mm -hmm. with Eric. I think they'll go to Martin's and then they'll. Because oh, I could come just see the, the two families getting together. There was comedy hilarity would ensue. <laughs> hilarity would ensue. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Neither one of us are like out on screen personas. Yeah, not, of course not. Not, yeah. not at all. I think that was one of the surprising things <laughs> when meeting Eddie. He's a gentle person, but he's an introvert. One thing the two stars of Candy Cane Lane do have in common with their Christmassy characters is their appreciation for all the magic this season brings. What are you oh. grateful for, give thanks for oh. at this time of year? Everything. Yeah. Everything. It's just a blessing to to be here and to have my family and to have been in this business for as long as I've been in this business and to still be making people laugh and making people happy for that's just a blessing. My family, my career, even just this experience. Um, you know, two years ago we were in lockdown. I get to bring a little bit of joy and softness into a world that's very hard right now. Mm -hmm. I've been able to have a career that has led me to working with Eddie Murphy and um, here, 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 because we had so much great stuff. Yeah. Oh, very cool. cool. Hard I love to have to watch for the kids right now, too. Like, yeah. we're watching the classics, but yep. it's nice to have something new we can yeah. watch. Yeah. Eddie Murphy's a grandpa, by the way. Yeah. How good is that? Yeah. That'd be a fun yeah. grandpa. He is on best. Amazon Prime. Jill's Steals and Deals is sponsored by Wells Fargo Credit Cards. Credit cards made for the way you live. That's real life ready. Happy Yay. Cyber Monday, Jilly Jilly. Today, Lifestyle and Commerce contributor Jill Martin Brooks needs no introduction, but here she is with gifts, deals on beauty, tech, all of it up to 86% off. Yeah, I see people online at stores. Don't go. No. Have a sip of coffee. Put your feet up. Just I got scan you the QR code and you're ready to rock. Yes, and a lot of the deals from last week are sold out, but they're still up, so we kept them on the okay. site for you. So I'm wearing one right now. Oh, okay. Pretty. Um, let's start with something that is an upgrade for a lot of people and a great gift. The Sutra Beauty Infrared Blowout Brush. The retail is $199. Now, you think you've seen this before, but you haven't. It's an all-in-one styling tool, so you can get a salon-quality blowout without actually going to the salon. Here's the deal. The brand says this upgraded brush has healthy heat technology. Mm. It gently and effectively dries your hair, which means not having to apply heat for long periods of time. Ooh. So it takes a shorter amount of time with this infrared technology. Technology, so it will. Um, you can avoid heat damage. Okay. It comes in blush, lilac, and sterling. And I keep thinking from Hoda. It feels Hoda good. Yeah, it's it's great. The ergonomic um, handle. Yeah. I keep going purple from Hoda's Boost. The, re <laughs> yeah. the retail purple. one ninety nine. Purple. The retail one ninety nine. The deal price thirty nine dollars. Oh, That's eighty percent off. Yeah, and my, like, I have one like this, but it's not this. And it's like a jet engine. It's so hot. So this is better for your that's, hair. If that's a great investment, if it's something yeah. you want to try out, okay. This is what a great gift. Stick a bow on it. Bella Pierre Cosmetics Ultimate Beauty Sets. The retail $120. There's three sets to choose from. You get everything in the set. 
Glam Dreamy and Nude. The deal price, $24. That's 80% off. Wowzers, let's go. Okay, Trust MD 24 Gold Skincare Trio. This is always selling out. The peptide face serum, the rejuvenating face cream, 10 sets of the hydrogel masks for under eye, eye lines. Um, we have the directions on today.com of how to do the process. This is great. The retail, $287. The deal price, $39. 86% off. Let's do jewelry. All right, a little sparkle. The Genevieve Jewelry House. Ha- Jewelry Halo Earrings, the retail $189. Okay, all different options here to sparkle for the new year, for the mm-hmm. holiday. You can take these on vacation with you and not worry about it. Great gift. They um, they are just great to dress up. You see all the different versions here close up. The deal price, $29, 85% off. Oh, pretty. All right, okay. pearls. Aren't pearls kind of having a moment? Yes, and I love this. They come with a certificate of authenticity, the DH Pearls Fresh um, freshwater pearl strands. The brand says has a stainless steel magnetic clasp. They're available in white, pink, black, or gray freshwater pearls. They come in um, this beautiful box, mm. and they are um, hand thread on silk. Lovely. So really beautiful. And actually, for moms, or I mean, getting the magnetic clasp instead of fighting over those. Yeah, and the nice. deal price forty nine eighty percent off. Can't go wrong with the True Buds Echo Tech for You. The retail eighty nine ninety nine. The deal price is eighteen on these. Okay, wow. they have twelve hours of continuous play, noise canceling. They, um, before you need to recharge them, they're a triumph. Cool. The deal price is $18 for each of the colors, 80% off. Oh, wow. And They're last but not cool. least, this is a twofer because it's a charger and it's a stand for recipes. Look at these beautiful cool. colors in the cool. toile. Um, multitasking to a new level. Comes with an adjustable stand. Brand says you could charge up three devices at the same time. 20 colors and patterns. These always blow out. The deal price, $19. Mm. That's 81% off. All right, Jill. Wow. Take us through these products one more time. Okay. We have the Sutra Beauty Infrared Blowout Brush, the Bella Pierre Cosmetics Ultimate Beauty Sets, the Trusted MD 24 Karat Gold Skincare Trio, the Genevieve Jewelry Halo Earrings, the DH Pearls Freshwater Pearl Strands, the Tech For You, True Buds Echo, and the Tech Theory Power Mask wireless charger and stand. All right. If you want to start shopping, scan the QR code or you could go to today.com slash deals. You'll find even more exclusives. Every deal from the last week of Jill's holiday extravaganza. If there's stuff, it's still there, still available. Okay. We should mention Jill is back Wednesday with one more round of great ideas. Yoda. All right, girl. Here I am with the amazing Nora Jones and Leve. They've teamed up. They've got some musical holiday cheer. They're going to light up Studio 1A. Do not miss their live performance. But first, this is Today on NBC. Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Oh, 
Well, welcome back. Nora Jones became a global phenomenon when she swept the 2003 Grammy Awards winning album, record, and song of the year, along with Best New Artist. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Since then, she's released a series of solo albums and collaborated with a diverse group of artists, including Willie Nelson, the Foo Fighters, and now she is teaming up with Leve on a two-track single of holiday songs. It's called Christmas with You, Nora Leve. Good morning. Good to see you. We've got Miss Grammy nominee, Miss Grammy winner here. Oh, this is a beautiful combination or what how did this begin somebody told me about her and um we decided to get together and we just had so much fun in the studio singing and playing and she did my podcast it was <laughs> now we're friends it's great <laughs> <laughs> now you're pals what are you guys going to sing for us today we're going to do um have yourself a merry little christmas <gasps> one of my favorites. oh all right ladies take go. it away Have yourself a merry little Christmas Let your heart be light Next year all our troubles will be out of sight Christmas now. 
made in heaven. How beautiful. Whoever, does, whoever thought this was a good idea was right. You yeah, guys are amazing. <laughs> Nora and Leve, thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. You guys are going to be back in the third hour with another festive performance in the fourth hour with us, too. Uh, but we'll be back after a little bit. Next year, all our troubles will be miles away. Morning on the third hour of today, holiday history. Yesterday, the single busiest travel day ever at our nation's airports. Everything went so smooth. So what do we need to expect for the rest of the travel season? We're live to get you all prepped up. Plus, point, click, shop. We're breaking down the Cyber Monday sales. How to tell if you're really getting a deal and why you may want to go shopping incognito. Then, Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross sharing their fun new holiday movie warm, fuzzy, Christmas spirit feeling. And making some shocking Christmas revelations. My sit down with the Hollywood superstars. And another amazing duo, nine time Grammy winner, Nora Jones and Grammy nominee, Leve, live performing their new Christmas collaboration. Today, Monday, November 27th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third hour of today. I'm Al, along with Dylan. Our good buddy Peter Alexander is here. Chanel and Craig are off. Happy Cyber Monday. Uh, yeah. oh, that's More right. shopping. More shopping. <laughs> Hope everybody had a good weekend. Uh, how about you? It was a great weekend. Um, we celebrated Thanksgiving on Friday uh -huh. because of just logistics with family, uh -huh. um, but everybody made it down. It was kids 16 table. of us. We love the kids' table. They love the kids' table. Um, it was our first gluten-free Thanksgiving. Nice. Um, every like my nephew, the one on the bottom there, he went back for three servings of stuffing, which all right. I think was a good, you that's know, a good, that's that, a good that, that was a good indication that yeah. it was good. So we had it all covered there. Um, but of course, as most holidays with young kids turn into, everyone was sick. It was like just uh, a petri dish of sickness mm. in the house. Oh, so yeah. yeah. So we're at, the, we're at the place with our girls, ten and eight, right? Where they now have like veto. Uh, Power? Ability, veto yeah. power over anything I show. So, like, no, 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 Dad, you can't show any of the holiday pictures. So, so, there are no pictures so here's what we have instead for yes. the Alexander family holiday. All the dogs Aww. got to meet each other from oh, my sister and my fine. other sister cute. and a brother. We've got Did the they whole all get gang. along? Yeah, so we got Moose, we got Agnes, we got that's yeah. ours, right? The little one in the back. She's Aww. just a nugget star. Everybody was together, everybody did great. And I just took off to New York, so it was my Smart. wife's problem. Yeah. So it was a good visit. Nice. Well, well played. Well what played. about you, Sky's first Thanksgiving? Yeah, it was great. I, I, my first Thanksgiving back, back doing the parade uh, mm -hmm. since last year. And uh, we had a great time. Hoda, Savannah, and I, just fantastic. Aww. And then uh, Sky and Wes and Courtney came down. The Nick's at home from school, from school. So we had a really nice Thanksgiving. You don't cook, though, right? No, no, I don't. But I'm thinking maybe next year we will start it Ooh. again now. With the, I've got a grand. Well, you got the little kids. Yeah, that's, start that's it all over. They're going to Grandma's house. Yay. Well, I'm glad everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend and it wasn't just a holiday weekend of course it was a record setting holiday weekend millions of people are still heading home this morning braving traffic and even some snow in some areas and we now know that yesterday was the busiest day ever for the tsa nbc's tom costello is live at bustling reagan national airport outside of washington dc tom you did get home at some point to have turkey right <laughs> I did, and a fantastic, fantastic Thanksgiving. But we just now heard from the TSA, and here are the numbers. 2.907 million people traveled Sunday alone. Wow. 2.907 million. That is an all-time record breaker. We did have significant delays because of that Midwest storm system. 7,500 delays yesterday. At the moment, we've got about 784 delays today. There's a ripple effect. It takes a while to recover. And make no mistake about it, if you thought you'd wait till today to fly, hoping things would lighten up a little bit, you're still going to be flying with 2.6 million of your best friends. 
Welcome to the week after the busiest travel day ever, with post-Thanksgiving crowds surging through just about every airport nationwide. Uh, hopefully we can get through this line and get to our gate pretty quickly. The TSA says it screened nearly 3 million passengers on Sunday. That shatters the previous record set back in June. Among the busiest airports, look at this. LAX with an estimated 230,000 passengers on Sunday. In Atlanta, 30,000 passengers were screened by 9 a.m. yesterday. Despite the rush, few reports of any problems. Everything went so smooth. It was so nice. We just had no trouble. We were using the TSA app to kind of look ahead of time and it showed that there wasn't any security lines, so that kind of helped alleviate the stress a little bit. One rather big exception, the Midwest. With a major winter storm causing hundreds of flight delays, but few cancellations at Chicago O'Hare. Meanwhile, AAA says more than 49 million Americans were driving over Thanksgiving. With all those drivers getting relief at the pump, the average per gallon now 325 for regular, down more than 30 cents from last year. In 2022, a driver traveling from Dallas to Denver would have spent roughly $114 on gas. This year, it's closer to $100. Welcome news heading into the Christmas travel rush. With gas prices falling below $3 a gallon in more states as we approach Christmas, uh, driving may be the best answer for uh, how you get to loved ones uh, for the holidays. If you're planning to fly over Christmas and New Year's, experts say there are still deals to be found. With the most popular domestic destinations, including New York, Orlando, L.A., Las Vegas, and Denver. For international trips, Tokyo, London, Paris, Shanghai, and Mexico City. Speaking of Denver, my hometown, remember last Christmas we had the major Southwest Airlines meltdown. Remember, two million people were affected, 16,000 flights canceled because of that massive storm in Denver and the Southwest computer outage. Southwest has since dramatically rebuilt its computer system, addressed its staffing problems. They say that that's behind them now. And nationwide this year, you guys, we've had only 1.3% of all flights delayed. 1.3% of all flights. That's it. So wow. actually, that's the lowest in 10 years. Right now, the system is handling the volume. Back to you guys. Well, that has something to do with you hanging out at the airport. Though. Yes. It's, uh, you're making they don't it, want to You're making it you. work. <laughs> traffic drifting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, just, I just direct all the traffic from here. <laughs> exactly. Is that Tom Costello on the tarmac? Absolutely. Tom, thank you. Well, at least they stuck the landing this go around. We're not complaining about that. So after the turkey and the travel, of course, comes the shopping. And, man, are we in the middle of it right now? Today is Cyber Monday. You probably woke up your inbox already just packed with those offers. But before you buy, we have NBC News senior business correspondent <laughs> Christine Romans with everything you need to know. Christine, good morning. Good Christine. morning. Good morning. So as we get started here, like where, how do you know if you're getting a deal or not? Like what yeah. are you supposed to be looking for as you get started? So a couple of things. You don't want to buy anything that's not 35% off or more, right? Because we know there are going to be record discounts this year. So that's my first piece of advice. You want a big, a big discount because you can wait heading into the end of the year. There will be more discounts. You can also install something that's called a browser extension which will essentially, it scrubs the internet for the best deals and will give you the coupon codes that you need to make sure you're getting the best deal. Also, there might be the same price for something you want at four or five different retailers, but one place you buy it might give you cash back or a mm -hmm. gift card. So that'll help you uh, figure that out. So make a list, stick to the list, and and take it easy today because mm -hmm. I think some of these deals are going to extend into the week. Yeah, because we're seeing that you just keep getting the emails about best Friday. Oh, no, well, right. into the week and uh, something like that. So how do you, you mentioned the browsers, but how else do you make sure you're not getting soaked when you go for these deals? Right. So you want to make sure that you're actually getting a 70% off, not a 70% off of an inflated price. Right. So you can go on Google Shopping and other sites where you can see exactly what the price history was something. Shop in incognito mode. What does that mean? Private browsing. All the browsers you can do a private privacy setting because some retailers know where you live or what you have been shopping for before and you mm -hmm. might get a different price. So that's going to guarantee that the retailer doesn't know who you are and right. they're trying to give you the best price. Really beware of low quality. What do I mean? There are some items that are made for Black Friday. Uh. So especially TVs, by the way, there are TVs that are basically a Black Friday version of a TV with mm. maybe only one HDMI port or mm. you know, they're not exactly maybe what you need for your purposes. So do your homework on the really, really cheap stuff. Mm.
There's a, I mean, I've been guilty of it. I'm scrolling through Instagram and I click I on this. Ooh, that looks like a great toy. How can you make sure you're not being scammed? So you want to make sure that you look at where the website is. HTTPS means it's a secure website. Look at all the letters in the name of it. You might get an mm -hmm. email or there might be some place that you, you're getting into something that's a fake target site or it's right. a fake site for something. Really look and make sure that it is the real thing. And you know, trust your gut. If you've never shopped there before, probably today is not mm. the day to be doing it. Use your trusted retailers and be sure if you're getting emails or you're stumbling along something in Instagram or on uh, social media, avoid links in, in, in emails and texts. Those can be phishing scams. Mm. And remember, credit card interest rates are record high. This is I'm going to put on my, you know, don't buy it if you don't need it hat. Mm. Um, if you are not paying it off, you're going to pay a lot of money in interest. We've never had, this is a year like no other. So be careful of playing, paying with plastic. Is that close okay. to 30% now? For store cards, they're above 30%. It's 20-some wow. mm -hmm. percent Which for just a regular. Discount. Exactly, exactly. Wow. So it's it's deadly to be carrying over a balance here. I put stuff in my cart last night, woke up this morning. Hey, where have you been? It's 20% extra Exactly, off. yeah. So, <laughs> so there's like deals on deals. Be if you're patient, yeah. be patient. You're in the driver's seat, America. You are in the driver's seat. The retailers want you to spend your money, so keep it in your pocket That's and wait for the best wait. deal. Okay? Wait. That's great. Patience. Yeah. Thank right. you. You're Christine, welcome. thanks so much. So when we come back, Hollywood goes holiday. I got the chance to sit down with Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross. You're about there. Their fun new family holiday movie and what's on their Christmas gift list. Third hour today, I'll be right back. the season for holiday movies and this morning we have a first look at a new festive flick. This is going to be fun. Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross, two Hollywood legends, are starring in their first holiday film. That's right, Peter. It, it's called Candy Cane Lane and not only is this Eddie and Tracy's first Christmas movie, it's the first time they've ever shared the screen together. I just want to win this thing. So it, it seems inconceivable to me that this movie, Candy Cane Lane, is the first time you two have actually worked together. And, and met. The with, first time we met. Yeah. It's the first time you've met I him. had never met him. How is that possible? He had never met me. Um, it's just, I don't leave my house. <laughs> <laughs> Their house and the pressure to win a competitive holiday light contest is at the center of Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross's new movie, Candy Cane Lane. A feel-good, action-packed, magic-infused collaboration. I'm going to show you guys something. And when I show you what I'm going to show you, don't freak out. It seems like you have been moving toward this, you know, during your career. And that, you know, when you first started, you were the, you know, the wise guy, the this. The now become kind of like family comedy guy and going into now the, uh, the holiday family guy. Well, yeah, but my next movie is Beverly Hills Cop. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be kicking ass. And <laughs> there's no Santa Claus in that one. No, no joy. Maybe you could have no done the two together. That. You could have combined them. Like, Ain't nobody going to be singing no jingles in that one. <laughs> no holly, no jolly. No None holly, of it. No jolly. <laughs> the new co-star's rapport on and off screen is palpable. She's going to do stand-up. You're going to do stand-up? No, but Eddie's going to coach me <laughs> one day, maybe. Uh -huh. Could you make somebody who hasn't done stand-up, would you be able to teach them how to do stand-up? So this was the no. conversation we no. had. He said no. no. She's already funny, though, mm -hmm. and that's what you can't teach. It's really? getting, up, getting on the stage and getting some structure and figuring out what you're going to say and all that other stuff. You have to be funny first to be able to do that. What'd I don't do? know. We'll see. We'll see. 
I won't say no to anything. But my plate is full at the moment. I'll... You both have full plates. My plate is wonderfully full. So I there's no... Have... I don't nope. turn down nothing but my collar. <laughs> <laughs> both very busy. Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross are looking forward to downtime during the holidays with family. Tracy says she relies on her mom, Diana Ross, when it comes to decking the hall. I don't do a tree. What? Wait, I'm what? so Wait, sorry. What? I'm so sorry. What? I do not do a Christmas tree. I don't do lights. I don't do nothing. But I go home and my mother is Christmas, Christmas. My mother's very Christmas. Very, 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 very Christmas. So she does the tree and yes, all that. Yes, I go home to the home I grew up in and it's Christmas galore. One year my mom answered the door as Mrs. Claus. And oh. I said, oh my God, mom. And she was like, Mrs. Claus. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that is very serious. Eddie says he's going to be creating Christmas magic for for his 10 kids and granddaughter, but also has his sights set on his own holiday wish list. You want a robot dog for Christmas? Uh, the robot dog, yes. I saw some dog, I forgot what the name of it is, but this- Robot it, it, dog. It, it, runs, it runs around, it's like an AI dog. It can run and then you, it doesn't mess on the carpet or do any of this stuff. It, when you come in the house, it goes like that to you and you could go send it to get a soda. And, and you combine it with this. The robot camera and the robot dog. I have a full-on robot Christmas. A merry robot, robot Christmas. Christmas. It's like my worst nightmare. <laughs> You're fascinated by this camera. I love it. I love it. I want one of those to go with me I everywhere. Keep I'm talking to you, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not. It's nice. It's a yeah, very Christmas nice camera. Robot dogs and cameras aside, Eddie Murphy and Tracy Ellis Ross say they're hoping to spread the true joy of this holiday season. What do you want people to come away with after they've watched this movie? That warm, fuzzy Christmas spirit feeling. You smell the food cooking, and your relatives are around, and Christmas all. All these things add to it, you know. I see a great movie together. Yeah, that feeling, you know, even if you've never seen snow before, but when those snowflakes come down, that feeling that you have, that special, magical thing that happens, I, I hope that people get to enjoy giggling with their family, laughing with their family of all ages, and enjoying a warm hug of a movie yeah. that makes you feel good. Yeah, I'm enchanted. <laughs> you know what's great about this movie? It combines so many different genres. There's stop action animation, kind of oh, like really? Rudolph. There's there's action, there's fun, there's comedy, and, and there's a lot of warmth, a lot yeah. of heart in this. And they go really well together. Oh my God. Their chemistry was amazing. I can't believe it's the first time they've been on together because it looks like they've been, I mean, they could just have a sequel one after another. Oh, well, when you see it, you'll see that there probably will be. Yeah. <laughs> in all likelihood. They know what in doing. the meantime, Candy Cane Lane premieres this Friday on Prime Video. Some thanks, Al. All right, Captain Up. They are four friends turned viral stars who affectionately call themselves the old gays. They are here to open up about their special brotherhood and their new project. Then later, Cyber Monday deals for under 25 bucks, gadgets, fashion, and beauty, like the game-changing products, Al for your hair. Ooh, can't we'll be wait. right back. Because that last stuff didn't work.
say we are smitten with our next group is an understatement. We're back with a modern story of brotherhood. They're four friends in their 60s and 70s who also just happen to be TikTok stars with more than 11 million followers it's online. wild. They affectionately call themselves the old gays. In their videos, the guys do everything from learning out the latest dance trend to deciphering Gen Z slang. I'm still trying to decipher Gen Z <laughs> slang. The project is a book titled The Old Gays Guide to the Good Life. Life. Bill Lyons, Jesse Martin, Robert Reeves, Mick Peterson, they are here joining us to talk all about it. Guys, so nice to see you. Good Good morning. Morning. So the way this started a few years ago, a young friend of yours started posting some videos of y'all hanging out and was entertained. Bill, walk me through this. How has this journey gone for you? Where has this taken you and what do you make of this stardom? I've, I still can't get over it. <laughs> I mean, it's just over my head. I thought we were great locally but we took a tour of the Western Mediterranean and we were recognized at every airport really? and every port that we stopped in. And that was a big surprise. Well, what I, th what I think is so great is it's the joy that you guys exude. There's the comedy, there's the dance routines, the costumes. But, but Jesse, in the book, you guys get to go a little bit deeper and reveal a little more of yourself. A lot deeper. Um, I even scared myself when we were doing the audible part, was reading it, and um, I just broke down twice. I had to stop because okay. reading because you're reading your life back, uh -huh. you know, and you just thought you're seeing this written. Go, whoa, that was me. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago, but it was it was really good. Yeah. All right, well, and I'm excited about the book. As you should be. I mean, yeah. you guys are in your 60s and 70s. You have 11 million followers, which is just wild. And I want to ask Mick because most of your audience is a younger generation. So what do you think you learn from them and what are they learning from you? Well, that's a good question. I think what I'm learning about our younger generation is I have complete faith in them. They seem much more uh, in tune with our world. Mm. And as a result, they bring us up. I think the combination of our two generations speaking to one another and breaking through any of those barriers it's not only therapeutic, but I think it just helps the world. This is so much fun because you guys are the, the good side of the internet, right? It's something joyful that can come out of TikTok and the internet and the like. So we have some help here, right? So we, we need some of your sage wisdom for some of our Gen Z and other viewers here who have written us some notes, millennials as well. They need your help. Here is the first one, okay? I love hosting friends for the holidays, but space in my apartment is tight, gentlemen, and I can't invite everyone I want. Inevitably, word gets out and people feel left out. How do I avoid this? What say you? Learn to say no. <laughs> yes. I mean, we're taught, yeah. we're taught when we're young, just yes, 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 yes. But you've got to put the boundaries up and say, you know, I've just got this much space. But that comes with being older. Wisdom, yeah. 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 Aging, I love aging. And I would say, yeah. get a hotel. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I second that. I would say, you know, you're young, you got the money, spend it on your friends and take them all out for dinner at a restaurant. Yeah. Oh, I love that one. All right. Oh, here's another one. Uh, what's an appropriate gift? Jose in New York asked this. What's an appropriate gift to give someone you're newly dating? I don't want to come on too strong, but still want to give something for the holidays. Oh. Robert? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're dating. <laughs> we talked about this yesterday. Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> Robert, how do you tell? Yeah, pull the curtain back. Uh, well. Nothing can that can be repeated. <laughs> your advice be wrong um give them a uh a, 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 a guide to the joy of sex oh <laughs> okay right. well happy holidays or to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> to maybe just start of start off with just giving them your book <laughs> yeah. thank you yes. okay <laughs> that's a good first step yeah. all right we've got this last one from carolyn in detroit What's the best response or reaction when opening a gift at the holidays? I feel like my comments feel forced when I'm put on the spot, or I'm bad at faking it if I don't like a gift. Why are yes, you laughing? Yes, I've done that. I just like go, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I, I would say, um, what a thoughtful gift. <laughs> okay. That's a good way out of it, yeah. But the face tells the truth. <laughs> and I would say, oh, 
I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lie. Yeah. Oh, that was guys, We love you having so you guys with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for having yeah. us. Pleasure. Enjoy very, the ride. A very yeah. happy holiday Thanks to you. Are. Thanks for being with us, fellas. Thank, Thank you. you. Very the much. book again, The Old Gay's Guide to the Good Life, is available right now. Makes a great gift. It does, yes. <laughs> it does. All right, coming up, a Cyber Monday edition of Today Best Sellers deals on everything from fashion to function, all for under 25 bucks. Then later in Start Today, we are working off some of that turkey and stuffing with a fun holiday themed workout. We'll be right back. with a special Cyber Monday edition of today's bestseller. Our team rounded up deals on handy home items, fashion, beauty, everything you like is under $25 Ooh. this morning. Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post is with us. Scan the QR code now and you can shop everything right from the comfort of your home. Chassie, good morning. Good morning. So many great deals, starting with one of the best gifts ever for children, mm. books. books 60% <laughs> off, over 60% off for these classic books. Eric Carle, we all know the Very Hungry Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the Very Hungry Caterpillar's very first encyclopedia. Oh, wow. cool. So the little caterpillar takes you through everything you want to know from space and science and animals and our bodies. Also, Judy Bloom, we got a mm. box set of the whole Fudge series. Uh -huh. So Eric Carle is under $10 mm -hmm. today. Judy Bloom, the whole set is around 15 and change. For all these books. Yes, and oh, I mean, great. that is a treasure. So you start one you want to keep going. So. Yep, a treasure yep. time reading with the kids. So 60% off. We That's just great. cracked open the Nancy Drews, Judy Bloom also. Oh, oh there you go. Wow. <laughs> Such a classic. So good. Talk to us about this device okay. here. This can do a lot of things for you. I'm obsessed with this. Okay, 40% off. This is from Hammerhead. Mm -hmm. And it is not only a cordless, but it's a rechargeable screwdriver. I'm afraid to get that one. <laughs> this is so great doing, you know, jobs around sure. the house. I'm normally intimidated by power tools, but this one's so compact yeah. that it's easy to use. You can get in tight spaces, and it's got mm -hmm. a little flashlight on the end. So oh. thirteen dollars oh, okay. and ninety-seven and it comes cents. With all those different nine That's different nice bits. I That's mean. Great. You know, this is a great gift for anyone, not just a handy person. Mm -hmm. So next, this is so cool. And again, a huge deal, 42% off. This is from Chamberlain, mm -hmm. and it's a smart garage controller. And what mm -hmm. it's going to do, it's going to transform a tip your uh, the garage door opener that you already have right. into a smart garage oh. door that you can control from your phone, oh. from anywhere. So as you're coming up to the exactly. garage, exactly. Boom. Or you, also when you realize you didn't close the garage when you're yes. home. That's what yes, that's yes, for. yes, yes. And you can just close it right there from your phone, and it also will alert you every time your garage door opens mm -hmm. or closes. Okay. And it's just around seventeen dollars, so forty-two percent off. Now right, here we go. The Al, here we go. Okay. Yeah, everybody likes a good belt. Gentlemen. Yes. We need this, to extend this a little bit right about now. So this is from Calvin Klein, and it is a two-in-one reversible belt. So oh. you guys are both wearing brown today, right. right? But tomorrow, let's say you want to wear black. So all you do is you pull it and twist it. So that's for today, uh -huh. your brown belt. Pull it and twist it. Oh, You've got a nice. black wow. belt. How do it know? <laughs> How do it? I feel like all belts and, should do that. There's right? Really yeah. It's a two High tech one, belts. Right? Two for the price of one. And oh. you get 30 around 31% off on top of that. 
and it's Even Calvin better. Klein. All right, help me okay. out over here, okay? This is for the ladies, I mean, as it were. If you've ever been to a wedding, mm -hmm. you've worn a pashmina, oh, and yeah. this is also from Calvin Klein, over 50% off. So this is so under soft. $20. It's incredibly soft. It feels so silky. Mm -hmm. And you can wear this with everything. Wear it as a scarf. You know, you can make it bigger. Wear it as a shawl. Oh, yes. Such a great gift, right? And it's so lightweight. It's four seasons. So, mm -hmm. you know, I wear this in the winter, right? But you know when they're blasting the air conditioner yes. and it's so cold in the summer? Boom. It also makes a great travel scarf. And what about That's our great. hair product? Okay. The Shop Today team is obsessed with r and Do you guys know this I've brand? I've never heard of it. Okay, around 30% off some of their top-selling thickening, thickening products. Yep. So we've got the Dallas Biotin Thickening Shampoo and Conditioner. 16 million TikTok views on this. Now and it's a thickening spray. Yes. Well, I don't think there's no amount of thickening that's going to do it. <laughs> but this stuff is designed to, you know, the brand says to give, you know, uh, lifeless hair, a uh, fine hair, a big boost and a zhuzh and make it look Ooh, more yeah, voluminous. It smells like a spa. Yeah, so good. Mm. And this thickening spray is great after you wash your hair. You just spray it in and it gives you the ultimate blow dry. The brand says it's volume at the roots mm. and, you know, control at the ends and also tons of body without that stiff feel. Yeah, that's great. Oh, so Jesse, I think you. everybody's going to love it. It's around $23 and change. Even better. Thank Thanks, you Jess. so much, Jazzy. Scan Jessie. that QR code or go to slash Cyber Monday to purchase these items. We should also mention that this segment is paid for by Amazon. These are some pretty good deals today. Coming up, a Start Today workout to help you de-stress and stay active during this busy holiday season. Then a little bit later, a magical Jeez. musical duo, nine-time Grammy winner Nora Jones and musical star Leve here to share their sweet new holiday song. That's right after this. for Start Today. There's a, maybe a little chance that you could have indulged over the holiday weekend. Well, now we're heading into a season of parties and sweet treats. So here to show us how to stay active and healthy during this time is founder and CEO of The Live Method, Mr. Matt Sauerhoff, who, by the way, also plays a trainer on TV. He was uh, my personal trainer, quote, when we both made an appearance <laughs> in Billions. <laughs> Matt, good to see you. Good to see you, Al. Well, thanks for being here. First That's of all, so, fun. so before we get moving, what are your three top tips for us to try to stay in shape or stay healthy during the holidays? Sure. Uh, let's let's keep it simple. Okay. Move more where you can. Okay. That could be just like helping out around the house, taking the dog for a little bit of an extra long walk. Right. Or just, um, sorry. Get stuff done. And then you say make <laughs> yeah. a, a colorful plate? Yes. Make, make a colorful plate. Exactly. Just fill it with leafy greens. Mm -hmm. Add a protein and then build from there. And stay present. Okay. Exactly. Staying present is my most favorite tip. Uh, it's the holiday season, time to enjoy, unwind, mm. and connect with your family. All right. So we can enjoy it. Okay, so you have four exercises to get our heart rate up. Yes, four exercises that will build functional strength for both in and out of the gym. Okay. The first exercise, since we're going to be doing a lot of picking up and lifting things around during right. the holiday season, is going to be a deadlift. So let's stand right on top. Go ahead and grab the kettlebell and stand straight up. So we're going to be lifting boxes throughout the holiday. Right. Christmas trees. Christmas trees, kids, 
Yeah, it's all presents. about the knee bend, right? So your back isn't out for the whole holiday season. Exactly. Keeping the back nice and strong. This is going to be building strength in our legs, our okay. core, and the upper back. Now, if you don't have one of these, what can you lift? Yeah, of course. So I wanted to show how we can integrate different things that we'll be but carrying around yeah. throughout the holiday. Yeah. So we've got lots of shopping bags for right, the holiday. Sure. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, grab on the handles and lift. And lift up. Boom. Okay. Now, now should you try to even it out? Yeah. Well, when you're doing a unilateral movement, loading on one side, like we often do, that can be part oh. of the training protocol as well. Hmm. I thought okay. you were saying even out the purchases for all the kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. there's that too. Yeah. All right, the clean and press, if you can, quickly. There's some way you can sort of weave this into your holiday routine too. Yeah, of course. I mean, we're, we're all traveling on the holiday. We have to pick up our luggage and put it into overhead compartments. Right. So here we'll be lifting something from off the ground up to the chest and then pressing overhead. Hold that. Okay, so oh. we're transferring Don't, Do not drop on your From head. the floor, yeah. up and over the head. The suitcase lift. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh. In fact, I think you have a suitcase right here. Yeah, exactly. Let me show you. So when we're going onto the airplane, ah. we often have to pick up our luggage, right. mm -hmm. lift it up above the head, and place it into the overhead compartment. Boom. And Boom. then try to make Practical. it spin. You're like, I swear it fits. Okay. Sit on the Chivalry's last plane. Chivalry's not dead on now, this yeah. plane. What about know? the farmer's carry? Farmer's carry. So during holiday, we have to carry things from our car, sure. grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. I wanted to teach you guys an exercise to build core strength, grip strength, and help us transfer from point A to point B. Okay. So go ahead, grab the weight on the outside of your hip, mm -hmm. and start to march. So yeah. This is gonna be a dynamic core movement where we have to stabilize our torso to balance. These slacks oh. are a little tighter than they were last. <laughs> <laughs> you can blame Thanksgiving. And then should you should you do that on, on the yeah, other side Yeah, do it on too? both sides. Okay. Set a timer, even it out on both okay. sides. This is all this good is stuff. great. Like okay, now you awesome. have a lower body work. Yes, works. lower body. We have the alternating reverse lunges. So this can be weighted or unweighted, oh, okay. but we're going to be going up and down stairs a lot through the sure. holiday, mm -hmm. carrying boxes. So go ahead, clean that weight up, and we're going to step back slowly and stand right back up. Okay. Alternating? Alternating sides. I'm coming off an injury, so I'm just going to watch. <laughs> okay. Sure, Peter. Sure. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, this is terrific. This is well, great. Matt, thank you. And you, this is some great. The functional stuff that we can do and work into our daily routine. Yeah, really thanks. Appreciate so. it. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. And thank you so much. And you thank have your you. wife back here. Yes, my oh. wife Danielle and Tony, one of our Tony. master trainers at the club. Thanks, guys. Thanks for helping us out. And remember, watch Al and his buddy on Billions. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Well, now that we've done our holiday workout, how about some music for the season? Grammy winner Nora Jones and global music star Leve are here to perform their new Christmas song. We'll be right back. series on today is proudly presented to you by city oh my gosh we are in for a real treat this morning grammy award-winning recording artist nora jones has worked with just about everybody from willie nelson to the foo fighters well now she is teaming up with grammy nominated singer leve whose songs have more than a billion streams worldwide so good they collaborated on new holiday music titled Christmas with you. Nora and Levy, thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy holidays. It's been a it's been a chill vibe in the studio. So yes. I'm so grateful <laughs> that you guys are here. This must have been a lot of fun coming up with your own song together for the holidays. How did you do it? How'd you come up with that? Well, we were working this summer actually on it and 
I, I think it was really, really hot. And we were thinking yeah. of, <laughs> and I, I live in LA now. I'm actually originally from Iceland. So I'm used to a cold winter, but I, you know, I'm having a hot winter in LA now. And <laughs> we we're talking about Christmas and how really it's just about who you're with, mm-hmm. not necessarily the snow. And yeah, yeah and this song kind of came about. So yeah. Nora, what was this like? Uh, you've worked with so many different people. What was the collaboration, the collaborative process like with Leva? It was extremely fun because we were just hanging out in the studio and it, it, everything happened really fast. She's an incredible musician. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we connected really easily. Yeah. And that doesn't always happen. So mm. it was really fun. And Leva, I mean, Nora is a nine-time Grammy-winning artist. I mean, how do you approach that whole dynamic when you write a song together? I mean, I'm I'm rarely starstruck, but I'm still very <laughs> starstruck by Nora. You know, I grew up listening to her, obviously, and and um, to get to sing and write with her is just such a joy and pleasure and honor. Yeah. Well, the pleasure is ours today. We're so glad you're here. The song is called Better Than Snow, Nora Jones. Leve, take it away. Sit by my fire I'll never leave you Look out the window Palm trees aglow Now as I sway through My ugly sweater Christmas with you to the ocean all through December it would be nice to hide from the cold then the sun warms me and I remember Christmas with you Christmas with you is better than snow. Watching the waves crash down on the shore. I never needed anything more than you here beside me. Jack Frost will mind if we stay in the heat of each other. We'll build sand castles instead of snowmen. We'll bake some cookies. Yeah, that was just beautiful. <laughs> Great you. way to start this holiday Thank season. You. Thank you so much. Christmas with you is available now. We're going to be right back. <laughs>
Peter, thanks so much for joining us thanks today. Thanks for including it's me. Nice Happy to holidays, y'all. Tomorrow on the third hour of today, Mario Lopez is live to tell us what to expect from Christmas in Rockefeller Center. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, fresh off her new baby announcement, Paris Hilton and her mom, Kathy. We hope to see you tomorrow. Have a great Cyber Monday. Don't buy too much. Hi everybody, good morning, welcome to today. Every day, we are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. Back in town, this has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. What? You deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. <laughs> Paris and Kathy Hilton. Plus, Instagram's fashion maven, Eva Chen, shows us four of the top trends for 2024 with the help of some Gen Z trendsetters. And it was a big weekend for the Beehive. We're going inside the world premiere of Beyonce's Renaissance movie. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, so up, it's today right now, with Hoda right now, oh, oh. and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hi, everybody. Welcome. It is the 27th day of November. It's a big day around here. We got a lot to talk about. We sure do. Jenna, uh, not only did you celebrate Thanksgiving with your family, you also celebrated a birthday. So much celebration. So little how many, time. How much cake? Did too we much have? cake. You had cake. Oh. Too much pie. Yes. But we had a wonderful time. How about you? You had the whole family here. Why did you gloss over yours like it? Because, why did you do that? Because that is we not already cool. discussed. Well, we couldn't well, have because it wasn't over yet. It was really fun. Yes. I got to have a really fun lunch with the kids. Yes. I told you how Henry goes, let's cheers, mom. She's never looked better. <laughs> and Mila goes, dad, why are you lying? <laughs> she has looked better. Um, so my kids are hilarious. I'm so happy. And it was fun. Did you get anything you liked or you don't do, you don't care about presents? Not really. Not really. Um, yeah. I'm going to start to needlepoint. So I'm sorry. Yes. Why? Because my husband gave me a needle pointed <gasps> canvas. My grandmother did it, oh. so I'd like to learn. Oh, that's a cool thing. But I don't know if it's going to really happen. No, you need lots of patience. Remember when I said I was going to do the DIY pumpkin? It's the same sort of thing. <laughs> I know. It's an item. By the way, it is How fun having... Oh, I ha we had everybody in. We had so much fun. It was like, I was going to say, I think it might have been my favorite Thanksgiving. Um, we had a great dinner. Colleen cooked this delicious meal. We hung out. Look we had fun. We played. We did all kinds. My kids did dances. Did the kids have the best time with the, the cousins? The kids and the cousins, man. That's it. That's all there is. Well, uh, oh, wait. And we, <laughs> you also did this thing. Y'all got to try this. Wait, we what? Totally, can you just explain? We totally stole it off Instagram. It's hard to see right there. But my kids laid is that you on the- shooting? Uh, I'm shooting. Okay. okay don't judge. <laughs> okay. So my kids were laying on the bed with their heads hung over the edge. And then you put sunglasses on their eyes. Hold on, I'll get closer so that's and I'll like get in focus. That's my mom's head. That's like Look, her. wait, hold on, get down here. Oh, oh yeah. Gosh. Anyway, they were in hysterical laughter. We had so much fun. It, it takes five seconds, pajama bottoms, glasses, glasses and shoes. Okay, I'm gonna try that. Try it with your I'm kids. I'm gonna try it with All right. Um, well, one thing that made my Thanksgiving day extra special was if you have been watching our show mm -hmm. and people seem to be because people stopped me on the street yep. people wrote me on Instagram yeah. you came up with a sign for me which was called the chipmunk which I was going to do during the parade that you were the Macy's do. parade that I was going to do just for you so that you know I was thinking about you now it was a very dramatic sign this wasn't just a little 
not a hair fluff. It here was it a here, scratch oh. or two. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I was like, three, two, get it! Because I, I, was pl I was trying to think of how to do it and when to do it. Yes. And I didn't want to be too obvious, but, but I also was... wanted to be on camera so that you knew <laughs> it was happening. And my sister said, don't scrub your tooth. It's going to look yucky. I said, I'm going to do it. I'm doing it all the way. She goes, just do something else. Don't, I go, no, that's what I'm doing. And we did it. Oh my gosh, okay. If I could just tell you what was happening <laughs> in the Hager household, yeah. we were around the fire. Yeah. Poppy loves the Macy's Day Parade. Always. Loves it. So we were watching y'all. We were watching you come in on the float like yes, a little queen. Yes, yes, the and float. And I pushed pause because I needed to run in to cook something because it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes, And Mama's got to cook, mm -hmm. okay? So I ran in and then I got a text from a friend that said, she did it. <laughs> She did it. So I ran back. I said, kids, gather around. Gather around the fire. Gather around the television. Henry was like, huh? Gather it around. was hard to explain what exactly was, you were doing, but, but you did it. You're you know a what? great friend. You got, you know what? You got to do it. When you say you're going to do it, you got to do it. I, do, you think, do you think Savannah thought you were a little crazy? <laughs> I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't mention it. I just kind of did it like this. Just a little, a little of that. Oh my gosh. Did you guys watch, by the way, while Thanksgiving and all were happening, yes. Dolly Parton made a splash. I mean, the, 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 it, in this Cowboy Stadium, my team, there she was. Look at, look at Dolly. Dressed this is, like a cheerleader. Yeah. And she sang her heart out. Can we just take a look at this? Yeah. Nine to five, for service and devotion. Can't. Dolly broke the I internet. I can't. That was amazing. Um, everybody was watching. Everybody. Everybody loves everybody. Dolly. Yes. My ch we were watching because I'm a Cowboys fan. Yeah. P P Poppy goes, I want to be a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader <laughs> when I grow up. <laughs> and I said, I want to be Dolly Parton yes. when I grow up. Because how incredible is she? By the way, she's amazing. I mean, the minute she came on, we were freaking out. Freaking. Because freaking. Henry said, Dolly's on. Yeah. I had also yeah, gone into clean. Because so that's, that's what mom cleaning. Well, that's what house. I'm sure everybody was doing similar things mm -hmm. and I came back and there she was. That's Do you remember when you had the, on the Dallas Cowboys cheerleading uniform? You know, it, there's a whole situation here. Do you remember that? I do Halloween? remember, but I have to say, uh, Dolly looked amazing. Dolly really did. And you know what was funny? When the commentators came on after two guys, yes. they were like, oh. They didn't know what to do. They Because, you know, what are you supposed to say? They didn't you, know what to I do. I kind of felt, because they weren't sure. Do you say wow? Do you say what? Do you, they, they didn't, didn't know, know what, what to, to do. do. By the way, it happens. And I get it. But all I have to say is all they had to say is Dolly for president. Yes. Done. And it, would, Dolly it was actually simple. Dolly for president. president. Um, okay. Well, we have been talking. Oh. That sound is important. Is that Santa? No, something oh. else. <laughs> it's Mariah calling because guess what, you guys? <laughs> She's about to be. No, no, we love Mariah. But we have recorded a new holiday song. It is called A, a Carefree, Carefree Christmas. Christmas. And what you're looking at right here is the album cover, baby. Yeah. We're, this, okay, should Anybody we show? Care? Should yeah. we show? Okay. We've actually cut a single. Um, it drops on Wednesday. Pe yes. People are talking about it. I love how you're talking with that music and by, lingo. And by people, I mean me us. and Jenna. I talked about no it on Fallon. Else. Do you yeah. think Fallon is going to have us to perform? <laughs> if we ask enough times. Well, I've asked him multiple times. This is, our, this is it. Um, a Carefree Christmas. And really, the star of this show is not pictured here. No. Remember? Yes. Cheryl, yeah, Cheryl is the star of the Cheryl show. Cheryl is a person who could teach anybody to sing she has her own yes. technique she's a she is like joy personified yes. yes and she ran us through the paces had us try to learn and, and it's it will be sound good because Cheryl of her. Porter's amazing but here's the thing we have tons of reveals this week okay because as Hoda said it's dropping Wednesday 
Today is our album cover. We only have one song on the album, but you guys, it could just be the first of many yeah. singles. Or maybe many. it's, yeah, it could be. It could be. Were you just about to say, no, I was I was only? It could be the only um, two. But this is what we want you guys to do. Follow along this week, and we'd like to, to chart. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we do, it's a Christmas miracle. We'd like to. Start. It would be fun. I think we could. Yeah. It's a fun song. It's fun. It just you makes you happy. You can dance around the house to it. Clean. It's joyful. You can clean or cook, cook or do all the yeah, things that yeah, yeah. us mothers have to do around this time of year. <sighs> yeah, I think it'd be fun. All right, all right, great. Anyway, all right, coming up. Alert the beehive. Uh, we've got some awesome new details from the premiere of Beyonce's That's Renaissance film. That's next. <laughs> As our matching shirt. Oh, yeah. Oh, gold. <laughs> oh, On this Monday morning, and it's a nice time for an announcement, it Jenna Bush Hager. It definitely is, and we are about to announce our last read with Jenna Choice for 2023. Drum roll, please. The December selection is We Must Not Think of Ourselves. Tell this, us about okay, this. Okay, this is a beautiful historical mm -hmm. fiction novel. It takes place in the Warsaw Ghetto uh, mm -hmm. after the Nazis have invaded. It follows Adam, who is mm. a young teacher who is following, he decides to write down the stories of everybody mm. that lives there so that they are never, ever forgotten. It is a book about hope. Mm. It is a love story. Mm. It is a, a book that shows that even in the darkest corners of the world, resilience, hopefulness, and joy exist. It's an important book. I read it a year ago. I chose it a year ago, but obviously um, there are some themes that are very timely. Mm -hmm. I hope you will read this with your friends and your family. Um, it, she was inspired by her own grandparents mm. to write this. Beautiful. And it's really moving and poignant. So you can go to your local indie bookstore. You can scan that QR code at the bottom of your screen for more info. Hoda, I think wow. you will love it. By the way, um, and a beautiful title too. Again, we must not think of ourselves. Mm. Beautiful. Okay. So all right. let's, we are moving on yes. to the beehive. Yes. Okay. It is time to look at all the big beehives. Beyonce news. Oh, yeah. We are going inside the Renaissance premiere. Okay. Ariana Davis, the editorial director for Today.com, was there. Wait a minute. You Ladies. were at the premiere. I was Wait, there. It, are you talking about the premiere where Beyonce was? Yes. That I was premiere? in the same. I can confirm. I was in the same space as Look Beyonce. Look at your nails. I can't listen, get over it. Listen. The, okay. It, tell us the scoop. Tell okay. Us. So I just got back last night. It was in L.A. right after Thanksgiving. And... The dress code was cozy opulence. So it was like a true Beyonce affair in that there wasn't what a red did you carpet, wear? What did you chrome wear? carpet. I wore a shimmery jumpsuit. I was like, I have to serve Renaissance, right? Like, yeah. you have to Ooh, do so. Oh, look, look at I me. There she it. was. But <laughs> listen, it was it was like, what is cozy opulence, well, right? Well, can I but ask you, you a question? What? Vlad, we gotta, get, we gotta get real about this. Nothing. Oh, that all those stars were wearing look cozy. No. It was just opulent. Yeah, it was just opulent on the chrome carpet. So it was Kelly Rowland and all of the former Destiny's Child members. Look they reunited this. for like a historic moment. Gabrielle Union was also there. Tia Maori, Lizzo. No, no, no. I mean, the stars came out and they served and completely slayed on this chrome carpet. So forget the red carpet, y'all. Yes. A chrome carpet is okay, where it's at. Well, now, what about Beyonce? Did you get a chance to see her? Yes. This was a very Beyonce event and that no phones were allowed, right? Ah, so it was like, as soon, like, as, we like got, as, soon as we got in, they locked your 
your phone in a bag. We didn't even find out where the address was until the night before at 2 a.m. It was like very top secret. Who so, got invited? You had to be special? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess you had to be a little special. Okay. Um, it was very top secret guest list, but it was it was just so iconic. And she came in with like this very light blonde hair, very different for her, for her wearing all silver. And she came with her daughters, Rumi, Blue Ivy, and Jay-Z. Oh they gosh. all came in right as the lights were dimming right before the screening of the movie. Okay, you have to tell us. I know you don't yeah. want to tell us everything about the film, but this is not just a straight up concert. Film. No, it's not. It is. It's definitely a little different than the heiress, uh, yeah. the, the movie, because it's a concert film, but in very Beyonce fashion, it's also part documentary. So she gets really raw and vulnerable, talks a lot about motherhood, about embracing life in her 40s. She talks about the fact that she had knee surgery just one month before the, the, the first tour stop. What? I mean, this woman, truly, there's nothing that she can't do. So she opens up about it all while also giving us all of the visuals of the tour. So if you got to go to the Renaissance tour, it's basically like you're getting to relive it all over again in this like really big cinematic way. And if you didn't get to go, you get to experience it for the first time. I love and that. And Blue Ivy, uh, there, was, there was stuff in there that was interesting and new. When she started out, I guess there was criticism about her in the show, which I didn't no. even know yes. about. Beyond, yeah. How did she react to that criticism? Any kid would be devastated, obviously, if someone criticized their performance. Of course, Beyonce reveals in the movie that she didn't even want her daughter to do it. And she really was like, Mom, I want to do this. So she said, if you commit to rehearsing, I will let you do it. And so she worked her butt off. And then people online were criticizing her dance moves. Oh and gosh. Blue Ivy says herself in the movie that instead of letting that deter her, she used that as motivation to just work harder and get it right. It was just like her, it was like, like Mother Lock Dot. It gave me chills. By the way, that tells you so much about really Blue does. Ivy in that it moment. Does. Because a lot of kids would have just crumbled and said, I don't want to do it anymore. It's like, remember when your kid quit something? Yeah. It's like, I'm not exactly. good. I but think about that resilience. She's amazing. And She's amazing. Yeah, she was Taylor, her mother's daughter. Taylor wasn't Taylor there. Taylor was not there. Taylor was not there, but it was because she was a little busy. She was in South America on okay. her tour. So a lot of people were wondering, is she going to return the favor? Beyonce went to her tour, yes. but she was performing in Sao Paulo on Saturday night. Okay, so awesome. she can do it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, you can check out Ariana's full essay of her big night. Go to HodaAndJenna.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, the fun and fabulous Paris Hilton is in the house. We're going to catch up with her, including the huge, beautiful family news she dropped over Thanksgiving. Coming up next. Paris Hilton has a lot going on. She's got a new season of her reality show, Paris in Love Plus. She's an entrepreneur, a, best, a New York Times bestselling author, and of course, she is a mom. Yeah, and a few days ago, she surprised us all when she announced the birth of her second child, a beautiful baby Aww. girl. Hi, Paris. Hi, Paris. Congratulations. Thank you. Baby London. Mm -hmm. Tell us everything. <laughs> she is just a little angel, and my life just feels so complete mm. with my little baby boy and my baby girl and we're just over the moon. Isn't that so funny? I feel like you've come on this show many times and each time you've come, you've been at a different chapter in your life. But this time you're happily married. You have two beautiful children. How does this kind of chapter in your life feel for you? I am loving my mom era. <laughs> and I just feel like just so at peace, just so happy, just so grateful for my husband and this beautiful family and life that we're building together. And I just, I couldn't imagine anything mm -hmm. else. I'm just mm. over the moon with everything. 
So baby Phoenix, your mm -hmm. son, mm -hmm. is 10 months. Mm -hmm. You basic I am a twin. You yeah. basically have kids that are so close in age. Uh -huh. Does he even understand what's happening here? I think he does. I'm like, this is your baby sister, London. And he's just so gentle and sweet. And he'll put his hand out and just kind of like rub oh. her arm or her face. It's just so cute. Uh. Well, Phoenix, you surprised your entire family. And you were like, basically, here's our son, which is such a cute surprise. What about for London? Did you uh, do the same? Well, the only people who knew were obviously Carter, yeah. and my mom and my sister, but my parents did not know when it was happening. Mm -hmm. They just knew that it was going to happen. So it was the best Thanksgiving surprise ever for everybody. Mm. You know, we, uh, we the last time you were here, you wrote your memoir, mm -hmm. and you wrote about some really heartbreaking mm -hmm. things that happened when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's changed the way you look at motherhood mm -hmm. um, at all? Definitely just now being a mom and just how protective you are. And I am just always thinking about, you know, one day when my kids are teenagers, mm -hmm. just how that's a scary thing. Yeah. So just, I don't know, just always going to yeah. be there for them. Well, I think, you know, I think a lot of people keep a secret, their trauma secret, because you feel like I can tuck it away and I can just carry it for my mm -hmm. whole life. I don't even have to say anything about it. I'll just continue and just carry this. But I think what you did, which I thought was super brave, is you decided, no, I'm not carrying it. I'm going to say it mm -hmm. out loud. So when parenting, because I think about this with my own kids, too, you want them to feel comfortable. There's not shame. And, you know, life is about just telling the truth. Yes. Is that something that you're trying to sort of impart? I know it's early, but it starts, <laughs> everything starts early, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something that's very important. And mm -hmm. Just not holding on to shame that shouldn't be on you. It should yeah. be on the people that hurt you. And the number one rule in our house is just to have kind human beings. So oh. that's what we're raising mm. them to be. That's so mm -hmm. beautiful. Okay, so we have a little debate because mm -hmm. you posted a picture with, with Britney Spears that was taken 17 years ago. You said you, you invented the selfie. Now, Hoda <laughs> believes she invented the selfie. <laughs> I hate to tell you this because I didn't want to debate it here on TV. <laughs> but it must be But debated. it must be talked about. Did you really invent it? I think we did. It was before iPhone. I mean, was that with the disposable camera? Yes. Oh, well, then she did invent it. Yes. <laughs> Touche. You did. You need to get some sort of some trademark some, for that. Yeah. Seriously. It's cute to see you and Brittany together. And both of you can yes, have told your truth. Yeah, yeah. Brittany, too. Do you guys keep in touch? Um, and just tell us about your relationship. Yeah, we were actually speaking a couple days ago and planning a girls' night, so she's going to come over, and I'm just so proud of her. Her book was so incredible, and she's just so brave for coming out and telling her story, and um, it's really amazing to see so many people doing that right now and really opening up and being real. I feel like that's something that's happening. Yeah, There's definitely. a lot of memoirs, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. And I think, and I do think, you know, we look back at that time and the sexism that both of you oh. have faced is, is really outrageous. If you look at those interviews, yeah. the questions you were asked, the questions Brittany she was, was asked, asked, yeah. Do you, do you, have y'all ever discussed that? We don't talk about that in particular, yeah. but it is something that, just looking back now, I just see and just I'm so happy things are finally changing and just mm -hmm. people seeing how wrong it was. Yeah, you just you just tolerated it a lot just because that's the way it was. Yeah. Let's talk about season two yeah, of your man. reality show, Paris, Paris in Love. Love. It's out Thursday. What can we expect? It's coming out Thursday on Peacock. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited about this season. Oh, it's awesome. really just everything from the moment Phoenix was oh born at the gosh. hospital, taking him home and being a wife and a mom and this new chapter in my life and I just, it's really an inside look at everything. A lot of it was filmed on an iPhone, so it's just very personal and very mm -hmm. real. I think you, it's so awesome to have that, even for yeah. just your family. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's you like know? the best home videos ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, Paris, you're not going anywhere, yeah, right? Yeah, because your mom's here. Yes. We've got yeah. Kathy Hilton. She's going to join us. Yeah, we'll get to see the moment she met Paris's infant son for the very first time. That's right after this. Cute.
This is your grandson, Phoenix Baron Hilton Ream. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> Parents, are you serious? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, what is it, baby? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God, that was the clip of oh. Kathy Hilton meeting her grandson, Phoenix, for the very first time. That's on the season And seeing of, it for the first time. And seeing it for the first time. That's on the reality yeah. show Paris in Love. Paris <gasps> and her mom, Kathy, are with us now. That how, was such a how beautiful, How was that? It's one moment. thing to feel it, another thing to oh watch it again. Oh, my goodness. It was the biggest surprise of my life. I thought it was, honestly, a puppy <laughs> or a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> and Paris has had monkeys before. We don't send the monkeys. Did you know that Paris farm. wanted to have kids eventually? Did you know that the day was coming one of these days? Yes, but I never wanted to push. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I said to her a couple of years ago, look, you are a businesswoman. You may decide yeah. that you don't want to even get married. I don't want to pressure. Yeah. Because we got married. I was 19 and Rick was 23. Wow. So I never. Is that right, Paris? Just double checking. <laughs> And you guys just celebrated your 44th wedding anniversary. Wow. Yes, Which we is did. incredible. What, what do you think is the secret? I think growing up together, moving to New York at a very young age. Yeah. And oh gosh, we, we, did it, we did it all yeah. uh, on our own. And mm -hmm. I think had we, a lot of people assume, yeah. oh, we're the Hilton, you know, yeah. we're rich. Yeah. yeah. I think that that could have been a big problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. We worked together. I worked, mm -hmm. he worked. And uh, I yeah. think just keeping the right people around, the right couples that you associate with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and always keeping that little bit of spice. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Paris loves hearing that. <laughs> do, you give, do you give advice to your daughter about um, a happy marriage, like the things that it takes? I do, and to my friends. I yeah. do it to everybody. You do? <laughs> yes. And what's your best advice? I would say just obviously open communication mm -hmm. and just never ever uh, take anyone for granted. granted yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Paris, what is your mom like as mm -hmm. a grandmother and has she gotten to meet baby London mm -hmm. yet? She is the best grandma. She's always coming up and surprising. I'll come home and she'll be. <laughs> in the nursery with Phoenix <laughs> holding him, and she just always just loves coming over and surprising us. And what do they call, what do you want them to call you when they can finally? All the children call me Kiki. Kiki? Kiki. Because, so just because? Cute. Just because. <laughs> I think that was my nickname with my little sisters when I was little. Oh. Well, speaking cute. of your sisters, yes. so you're not, you're, you were on The Real Housewives. You're yeah. not doing that. I'm doing Paris in Love. Paris in Love. But you never know. But, no. you know, you're cl very close with your sisters. Yeah. Yes. And we know that Kyle has been yeah. going through a tricky time with her yeah. husband. What, what has that been like for you as her sister? When I, when I first saw it, I was just like, it broke, it just broke my heart. Yeah. But it, I just think that, unfortunately, yeah. I just want Kyle, but believe it or not, she's the youngest, but she's the strongest. Yeah. Mm. She's bossiest. <laughs> I mean, is yeah. that true? Yeah. yeah. And Nikki's that way with you. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm the youngest and I'm the bossiest. Yeah, I get it. Bossiest. Sometimes you have to be. So she's very strong. She's yeah. resilient. And um, Do you think I love my nieces. Yeah. I just want her. To be, to be happy. happy. Do you and if think she's... they'll get back together? People are saying, speculating, they're going to get back together or they spent Thanksgiving together. Well, honestly, yeah. you're asking me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no way that Kyle would have gone this far unless she really thought about it. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's so sad. She's looking hotter than ever, though. She yeah. Sure we, is. Yes. We know you're very close with your aunt as yes. well. Yes. Um, okay. and, then the, and then the dating's going to start. Yeah. Down the road. Yes. <laughs> you're going to have to give advice there. Oh, there exactly. You again. Um, okay, wait. We have to talk about Carter, your husband. Yes. How, what has it been like with him welcoming mm -hmm. this new baby? Mm -hmm. he, first of all, I know him. He's yeah. the loveliest mm -hmm. human. He is. Mm -hmm. And you set them up? Well, it was really through my very dear friend that's his sister. Oh. And she kept talking about it and talking about it. And Paris had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I said, you know, let's just give it a little break. It's always good to yeah. not jump from one to the other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I said, let's stop by. And it was Thanksgiving. And she had mm -hmm. just come in from Europe. Mm -hmm. So I thought, 
she'd say, no, I want to go home and go to take a nap. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'll stop by. Oh, wow. And I didn't know that Carter was going to be there. Yeah. Oh, oh. So it just was by Sarah and Four years ago on Thanksgiving. Four wow. years ago. My life has And then we the went same. back for wow. dinner that Amazing. night. Ooh. And she was so excited. Wow. Well, we are so happy to have both of you on. Congratulations on season two. Can, more, more than that, congratulations on, your on both your babies. You. And your, I'm so proud. And so, yeah. I'm sure you are so proud of her. Yeah. I've been uh, three times now to Washington with her and to see yes. her standing up and having a voice. Yes. You know what? Sometimes in life, I think there, we go through things. Yeah. And she's making such well, a difference. She's been she advocating sure for women. Yes. And when I read your memoir, I knew you before, but after your memoir, I saw such a different and beautiful side of you. Thank so thank you. you for sharing it and thank yeah, you for fighting. And you, for thank you else. for using your voice. It's incredible. You. you can check out the new season of Paris in Love this Thursday on NBC streaming platform, Peacock. Coming up, style trends from some of the most fashion forward influencers on Instagram. That's coming up next. Yes. We're still a month away, but the top trends of 2024 have arrived. Here with a sneak peek is Instagram's head of fashion partnerships, Eva Chen, and she's brought along the trendsetters themselves mm -hmm. who are going to model these looks. Okay, uh, Eva. Yeah. What do we have here? Instagram <laughs> has ranked all these trends. Yeah. What is in? So we have a trend report coming out just next week okay. for Gen Z creators to model the trends. Okay. Gen Z is setting the trends. Gen Z. All right, let's start off with Jess Shu. Jess is here, and okay. she's got a look and you're not gonna believe what's happening here. Okay, so check out Jess. She is so creative and cool. She's wearing pants right now as a top. This Wait, is a what? Look. Wait, seriously. Those are a pair of pants. Yes. You can see. It's all about creativity. It's all so about cool. wearing things in unexpected ways. And she's wearing two pairs of double shorts. So cool. Wait, okay, how did you come up with this idea? So I'm all about repurposing pre-existing pieces in my closet because I want to shop more sustainably yeah. and more intentionally next year. Yeah. So I was like, okay, how do I get these shorts to be a bit longer and have a crazier silhouette? So I was like, double it up, why not? Boom, and, and then, how about the pant top? Okay, so I really wanted to go for a full leather look and I didn't really have a leather top, so here it is. There oh my go. God, girl. Instead of Please. just buying something. So yes. Like sustainability is one of the trends that Instagram has seen more of. Oh, absolutely. That would see that would be the top trend for us in our trend report that's coming out. Okay. Like, okay. All about sustainability. Okay. I think. All right. Perfect. Important. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. All right. Okay. Who's next? Thank Yay. you. Who do we have here? Is We've it got Ava? Ava. Hi, Ava. Ava. Okay. You're beautiful. Oh, this so is a, a Canadian tuxedo. Canadian tuxedos. Did they ever go away? No, Not I don't think really. so. Really, they're still here and they are ragingly cool. Like Ava's look, it's all about remixing it too. Like you have the leather jacket, you have the belt. Western boot, and it's like, it just looks effortlessly cool on her. Ava, how did you come up with this? So this is all thrifted. So it's very easy to find for cheap. And I have this denim button up. I just layered a leather jacket over it to match the belt and the shoes to just make it more me. But 
It looks so it looks cool. So cool. We I do mean, like, know that so cool. Cowgirl is in. Remember, it's it was like super coastal in. cowgirl. Coastal we don't know what cowgirl, that means. But, but you look incredible, Ava. By the way, I love that. I love it. And the jewelry, all of it. Okay, all right, Ava, thank you. Ava. Thanks, Ava. Ava. All right, let's we bring out Emma. Emma. Emma's Emma. got a cozy this look. Is Emma Rogue. Now, this is a, an outfit I probably worn, would have worn in high school. Yeah, totally. The baby cool. tee, the camo, totally. the wide leg jeans. Like, super, super cool. 90. All sustainable, all thrifted. And I mean, she's just a cool girl. Emma. Emma. Camo, yeah. urban camo too. We're not, you know, that's awesome. Tell us about your look. Yes, so camo is going to be one of the biggest trends of 2024, along with vintage, of course. It's literally my life. Uh, I thrifted this jacket a couple years ago, and it's served me well over the winters. Yeah. I have this cute baby tee, which I screen printed myself. <laughs> and then, of course, that you what yourself? Screen printed. Painted. You did? Yeah. God. And then, you know, had to top it off with the Jinko jeans. Can't go wrong with, like, big baggy really jeans. They were in. I <laughs> told you. I told you last what week. About what about the boots? Oh, the boots I got on eBay for about 90 bucks. They're vintage new rocks. Wow. Yeah. Stop. Vintage, vintage, vintage. Sustainability, thrifting. That's what you're here over and over again. Okay. All right. I love Come that. on. Thank you so much. Thank Let's you. bring out Armiel Chandler. Come on out. Okay. Oh, yes. Can you believe Red. it? Red. Maximalism. So chic. More is more. Like just wearing it all and like going for it, honestly. Yeah. Like, and look at, check out those accessories. I can't. Talk and to us we about this look. Red was the color of the season, and it yeah. seems it is the color of the season. Is giving very much holiday party at four o'clock and yeah. a dinner with the girls at eight. Um, so it's all about intentional shopping and shopping with a purpose. So yeah. statement pants is one of those things that you can shop intentionally. You yeah. can figure out different ways to wear them. So as you see today, this is giving very holiday-ish, yes. very fun, a pop of color, and a nice little pizzazz. Look at your boutonniere and your hat. You got all the. What about the shoes? What's happening? The shoes there? are very much thrifted, but they are Doc Martens. Oh, um, if you want to spice up a jacket you can get some flower accessories from Etsy these are like four dollars yeah. and it's all about shopping intentional and figuring out ways to style pieces in an affordable price trendsetters come on oh out gosh. all the trendsetters yeah. y'all these really are so cute. good Four amazing Instagram Gen Z creators showing off four amazing fashions so she they look amazing thank you guys and you did tell me those jeans were back I did we're back. Eva did a book event for Barbara and me she's the most generous Eva is the queen she's oh, I'm wearing my wide leg jeans of course too. you are all right guys <laughs> Thank you all so much. Coming up next, a memory expert. You will not forget his tricks for developing a sharper mind. Coming up next. They are so cool. So much going on during the holidays, it's easy to forget things like <laughs> shopping lists, names of people you met at a party, and just about everything in between. Okay, so we're going to help you out, and we're going to help ourselves out. We're going to enlist the help of Nelson, Nelson Dellis, a memory expert who recently went viral, proving just how impressive his mind is. Take a look. 3383406029. Eight one seven zero four six three six five zero six seven zero four 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 five six four nine six four two zero nine four seven six two three four five seven four seven seven one nine six five three three eight three four zero six zero two nine nine two zero six zero four three eight three three zero five six three six four zero seven one eight. 
We don't know what just Nelson's the author of the book. It's called Remember It. Good morning. Okay, so are you born a genius? What's happening here? No, so this is a skill that I taught myself about 12, 13 years ago. Um, I wasn't born with a, an amazing memory. So I couldn't do that. What inspired why did you, this? Yeah, why'd you yeah. do that? Yeah, so my grandmother uh, struggled with Alzheimer's for a few years um, right when I was learning about these championships, and I decided to take it into my own hands and I didn't want to end up like that. So. Were you like a normal person like us? You couldn't remember <laughs> things on your shopping list. I 100%. Was, I, oh, you yeah. were. Okay. Yeah. So you could train your brain. Yeah. So anybody can teach themselves to have a memory like this? Yep. And there are competitions for this, and everybody's kind of like me, where they had no experience. They couldn't really do much with their memory, and they train these techniques to be able to do things like that. So what are give a couple tips. Give us a couple of yeah. things. So if you draw a blank on it, you're looking at someone, and you're like, I know their name. I can't think of it. Yeah, so one thing you can do there is is try to maybe go through the alphabet in your mind, A, B, uh -huh. C, and see if anything kind of jogs Triggers. your memory. Yeah. Um, another thing is the importance of just training your memory and practicing using your memory more often, which we don't do these days. Because of our phones? Our yeah, phones, everything. Oh. When you do that, you, you start to see information differently and process it differently. And your memory kind of comes alive. So don't Google, like, what was yeah, that movie? Yeah. Yes. Instead of Googling it, just sit and think Struggle about. a little bit. I know that's Struggle. uncomfortable, but it actually, when you try to use your memory, when you try to Do remember you know how often or... we yell the words Google it around <laughs> yeah. here? We got to slow our Googling. Maybe we should. Maybe. All right, you have an activity that will help yes. us remember a grocery list. Yeah, because sometimes it's, it's, it's an, the problem with information is you're, you, you know it's in your mind, you just can't get it. Can't so it's a storage it. problem. Okay. So how do you place the information in there? And there's okay. this technique called the memory palace where you use a familiar place. We can use this little this set little here okay. uh, to place images of the things on our list. So oh. mental images. So okay. I have some random stuff here like toilet, toilet paper. paper. Yes, important. Okay. So imagine maybe where I'm sitting. Uh, a you big imagine, roll of toilet big, paper. I'm, toilet I'm paper. just carrying a toilet bunch paper. of them. You just okay. make it weird and silly. Over okay. the top is better. Okay. Then you have you do okay. uh, a dozen eggs. So maybe here. You, We're cracking them in there. Yeah, you can imagine, cracking. like really try to yeah. use your visual yeah. uh, okay. in, the, in the senses so the eggs are everywhere. Okay. Um, then maybe where you're sitting, I just you're dump milk. some milk all over you. You're dumping it on right? me. Remember when I told you that thing about... No. <laughs> I don't, I, don't remember. Remember. I don't remember it. I blocked it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we have avocados, right? Uh, so maybe you oh, are maybe dressed like an avocado. Oh, I'm maybe happy to. Oh my God, green. I can see it. It's cute. <laughs> and then broccoli, I don't know, maybe in the middle there's a big sprout of yeah. broccoli. Oh, right there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I see it. So when you're at the grocery okay, store, you've so done this. Okay, so now we got it. Let's house. do it. Let's do it. So Ready? What Let's am do I it. We know it. Wait, toilet paper, eggs, milk, avocado, broccoli. Yeah. I mean, if we couldn't remember that, we have a problem. Okay, yeah. we are going to do something right now okay. that we've been really looking forward to. Okay. You have not seen this number. Mm -hmm. oh, We're okay. going to give you a number. Yep. A string of numbers. You are going to recite them back to us, correct? Okay, okay. Yep. okay, okay. ready? All right, so one one digit or so per second. Okay. One digit per second. Um, go for okay. it. Okay. Seven, nine, six, one, five. Oh, slow down a little bit. Eight. Wait, hold on. So, so, sorry. Just seven, start again. So, Should we start from the so, beginning? Yeah, yeah. Seven, start from the beginning. Nine, Six, one, five, eight, two, zero, zero, seven, two, six, four, two, four, five, three, nine, three, two. All right, give me a second to process it. All right, so seven nine six one five eight two zero um, uh, zero seven two six four two four five um, and then three nine three two. And then and then backwards uh, would be two three uh, nine three five four two four um, six two one uh, seven zero uh, zero two eight five um, one six nine seven. Oh my God. I'm buying your book immediately. Okay. <laughs> I'm buying your book immediately. I'm buying your book immediately. I mean, I'll give you one. No, wait, how do you, what did you we do? We gotta okay, go. We gotta go, but this I, is crazy. Just, what, I use the memory Buy the palace book. What's the book and, called again? Uh, remember it. Remember, remember it. it. We can't remember it. What's the it. book <laughs> called again? No, sir. We'll be back right after this. What's the book called <laughs> again? <laughs>
thank you so much for kicking your week off with us. Tomorrow, y'all, we've got Jennifer Garner. Plus, actress and singer Sophia Carson will stop by. That sounds fun. See ya. Bye, y'all. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on Today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's Today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on Today. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. But this then, is crazy. Yeah. This is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I want to learn some basics. So, I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom and they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce um, and an apple. You know, they're very different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallhold, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, crumini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants.
Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms, called pins, start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis, and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block, about 90% of it is sawdust. Smallhold's mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is large, like third party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas. And so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, we have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, but we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster. Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. Do you roast the whole thing? I just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off. Pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. And when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Um, which Cause is you can pull it like so yeah, it's almost you can stringy. Pull it. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this, and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. And these are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but 
these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber. They have amazing antioxidants. They have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now. Smallhold got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms. And I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? you Like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for a, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So they are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna, you wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. You don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one. This is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second, we're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> right, so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make 
a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your you house do and that. do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy-free, soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Sesame it. oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get some, get a good like, salt in there. Right. And then you're just gonna whiskey do, dude. So this is gonna get, I think we have this on medium heat. Okay. Okay. We have some grapeseed oil here. The reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point. We're using cast iron. You don't have to use cast iron. You can use whatever you have. Um, so we're going um, score side down. down. So what's gonna happen? We're yeah. gonna put them on. We're gonna get a good sear on each side. And then we're gonna brush our glaze on. Okay. Okay. Two minutes, flip it, two minutes. Then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop it <laughs> down. What we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just take flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would we do for I'm sorry, do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to yep. encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, I and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Look Wait. It, look at it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush this on, <laughs> almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh. Come on, baby. Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God, you, but except you could do this, but you see I the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me, too. Uh -huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes, he doesn't need to. Okay. not Nothing trying to crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's main steaks. It's meaty, Can we dog. show them? <laughs> like, they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like, it almost, it's almost like, like you wouldn't really know. It kind of, it just looks like Chicken. Mm -hmm. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First, some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. Mm. It's so good. Wait, this is, mm. this is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good. I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner, to mushrooms, mm -hmm. a really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, mm -hmm. in this format. Mm -hmm. Try cooking them this way, yeah. and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Because like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's main steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute.
Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a where, super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want from meat, but then all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's we'll start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein, Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium, we call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this, where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root, and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom root. I'm gonna Go. eat it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't want to say nothing because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know, is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast. Really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand, and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient lists, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted.
In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? right, right. When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce, Super porous, yeah. soak up anything that you give it. So best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready. All right, to flip. ready? Yeah. <gasps> I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges. All right, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking out right now. Into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my God, I just touched it for the first time too. It's like the the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see, I feel like it has that. But how? That's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. Okay, I'm gonna taste it. Should I taste it? This will be your first time, like, yes. stressed. Yes, Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can drop? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken. Literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. Do you need another mic to drop? I need another again? mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm leaving. <laughs> I see my book. Yep. This is from my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute. I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> that is a pretty big sandwich. Mm. I'm taking this home. This, wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians. Like something weird is going on here. <laughs> Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true me fashion, we need to take a selfie. So yes. if you don't mind, yes. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special. No, truly. thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. That's a beautiful piece of chicken. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen.
comfort food. From a decadent cheeseburger, to a sky-high layer cake, or my favorite, my mom's spicy warming doll. Usually these indulgent eats aren't exactly vegan friendly. Even many traditional doll recipes are often prepared with ghee. But these days you can easily ditch the dairy and you won't even miss the meat with new plant-based takes on traditional comfort foods being served at restaurants all across the country. In Portland, I'm meeting a chef making crunchy fried chicken without the bird. And in New York, I'm sampling a big apple staple, cheesecake. But this one happens to be raw and vegan. But first up, I'm heading to Los Angeles, my hometown, to visit a popular fast food chain serving up show-stopping burgers without the beef. Growing up in SoCal, there was nothing more comforting than grabbing a burger by the beach and cruising down the Pacific Coast Highway. Monty's Good Burger in LA is recreating that iconic experience for a plant-based generation. Everything here, from a melty cheeseburger to fully loaded fries and even their creamy milkshakes is totally vegan. Lexi Jarris is the co-founder of the Up and Coming chain. What inspired you to start this place? I and my partners, it, it was a time in the vegan space in LA where there wasn't just a really good casual vegan burger. I felt like in order to get that like fix for a burger, I had to go somewhere with like white tablecloths and like you had to be waited on. In 2018, Lexi founded Monty's with Bill Fold and Nick Adler. Lexi and Bill both work in the music industry. He's a festival producer, and Lexi is a creative consultant for Coachella. Nick brought the culinary chops as a former food director for music festivals. I think because we all come from music, when it came time to like market and brand and like strategize how to grow, we were all coming at it from such like a non-traditional viewpoint. The Monty's team runs their business differently from many restaurants. They focus on creating digital buzz with celebrity milkshake collabs, pop-ups at festivals, and lots of merch. While Monty's now has five locations and millions of burgers sold, they make more money from their swag, like hats, t-shirts, and mugs, than the food. The star of said merch and the brand's namesake is Lexi's adorable schnoodle mix. How did Monty become the mascot? He's lucky. He's a lucky pup. He's very lucky. He was found essentially on the streets of Riverside, which is kind of nuts. We looked for his owners. They were nowhere to be found. So after a few weeks, I was like, this is my, this is my son now. But it really kind of, again, kind of goes to show like the playfulness and like the headspace we were in when we started Monty's. Do work a lot with animal rescues now, and that is kind of something that's like in our ethos. We care a lot about animals, obviously, um, but not just <laughs> eating less of them, but also giving some like fluffy guys and then around the LA area homes. Monty's is dedicated to getting pets adopted, from dogs to cats and even guinea pigs. But their main mission is to change how people see vegan food. I think what's really interesting is that there is this stigma and this stereotype that vegan food has to be super healthy, right? When I first became vegan, a lot of my friends that aren't vegan would have dinner with me and they would leave and be like, I'm still hungry, I hate when Lexi picks the restaurant. I think if you come here, I highly doubt that someone will leave here. I mean, still being hungry, it's, it's lots of tots, lots of shake, lots of burger. To me, I feel that anytime someone is eating a plant-based meal instead of a meal that has like dairy, meat, whatever, that's just kind of a win for like the animals, the planet, their health, all that good stuff. I love that. Tell me about the future of Monty's. Where do you want to take this? Yes, I mean, honestly, like the sky's the limit. Like, I don't want to say too big, but we're all definitely thinking like as big as America wants us to be. Amazing. I'm so hungry now. <laughs> I want everything. I will order every single thing.
Monty's Good Burger is reimagining fast food for a new era. Co-founder Lexi Jarris introduced me to Gemma Kessler, the chain's operation manager. Gemma trains new chefs on how to cook the entire menu, which includes a plant-based chicken sandwich and fully loaded fries. And she's teaching me how to make the restaurant's signature item. Okay, Gemma, you are gonna show me how to make the Monty's Good Burger. Let's do it, let's I think go. You're ready. Making a Monty's Burger isn't all that different from prepping a beef patty. First up, Gemma oils the grill so the impossible patties don't stick. And then we're gonna smash those patties down. So I am going to use both spatulas and really get that squeezing out the edges there, as you can see. Nice. Number one. Number two. Perfect. Awesome. And now we're gonna have those just crisp up and cook on one side, and then we're gonna flip them. Flip it. Check Gorgeous. that out. Good thing I didn't screw that up on camera. <laughs> right. Next up, two slices of vegan cheese. And now I'm gonna have you spray a little bit of water on the outside there, creating some steam. All right. Perfect. Nice, that's gonna get all melty and melty, delicious. Melty, cheesy, we delicious. Love it. Next, we're going to raise this and add some grilled onions. My favorite. <laughs> this is like your entire store of grilled Amazing. onions. All right, perfect. Perfect, perfect. All right, and that's that it. Ready to go. To finish the burger, we get the perfect toast on our buns. See you later. <laughs> Time for the Monty's house bread. It's similar to a Thousand Island sauce. And what burger is complete without a pickle? Three juicy house-made pickles. Now the patty meets the bun. To your bottom this bun. This is the best part of my day. Okay. <laughs> this is going straight on here. There you go. I feel like I'm hired. I don't want to be forward, but okay. I think you might be. <laughs> this is the final step though. This is the important part. Okay. To build it all together. All right. Yeah, but you're gonna fold that forward. Gorgeous. <laughs> okay, I am so excited to eat this. I want to try everything else on your menu. Should we go find Lexi? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, I'm ready? So Cheers. Ready? Cheers. Cheers. Okay. I can't. It's just good to you remember. It's better. This is so insane. Because it has your touch. Lexi, what does it mean to you to have this amazing and plant-based contribution to California burger culture? This is our Culver City location. So this is definitely our most family-friendly location. We have customers that like come in strollers with their parents, obviously, <laughs> and they get like pins and stickers and things like that. But like these kids are gonna grow up with us around the corner from us. I think that's so just, like brings me a lot of joy. Especially growing up in California, and this was such a big part of my culture. Like getting a burger whenever, going to the beach, and yeah. I feel like I can have that experience again in a plant-based way. So thank you and cheers. It means the world. Thank you so much. <laughs> have to take a picture, please, because this just feels right. We love photos around here. Cheers. This juicy burger had me craving more comfort food. So I'm off to Portland, where one vegan chef with a unique story is putting his own twist on Southern soul food.
Portland, Oregon is one of the best cities for plant-based living. From vegan donuts in every flavor imaginable, to the world's first all-vegan barbecue joint, there is no shortage of delicious veggie-forward fare here. One of my favorite spots is Dirty Lettuce, a vegan soul food eatery helmed by a chef breaking barriers. This is Super very tasty. visually impressive. Like, this literally is taking me back to like a KFC bucket. Yes. Alke Bulan Morosky is the chef and founder of Dirty Lettuce. How do you feel like you're making vegan food more accessible, more equitable, something that is digestible, no pun intended, yeah. <laughs> to a wider audience? I feel like a lot of the vegan industry for a long time has had this very, very heavy focus on like making it as healthy and holistic as possible. And that is very important, but it's like there's a reason why McDonald's is like the colossal juggernaut it is, because sometimes people just want to be able to eat something greasy and delicious and feel good in their stomach. <laughs> Alcabalon's soul food recipes are rooted in the Southern cooking traditions from their hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. You grew up in Mississippi, pescatarian, so eating a lot of veggies, no meat. Can you talk to me about what that was like, especially in the South, the very meat-heavy culture? Yeah, it was, it was one of the things that made me want to do this, was I spent my whole childhood in the South, like, surrounded by lots of fascinating cuisine, like gumbos, etouffees, and whatnot. I remember always wanting to be able to try and enjoy these different foods and never really having the opportunity to, and until I decided to just do it myself. For instance, it means like cookouts are a really, really big thing in the South. And if you don't eat a lot of animal products, then you generally can't really go and engage with them to the same extent everyone else can. Growing up in the South was challenging in different ways for Al Kabalon, who is biracial and identifies as gender neutral. Did you feel like you had a sense of belonging growing up? I definitely don't really describe myself as a very masculine, per masculine person, but being a person that most people ID as just like a black man when they see me, meant that there was a lot of intense pressure to like put on a performance of masculinity that just wasn't me at all. And I wonder, was that a reason why you started cooking? Was it a way for you to find a sense of belonging in any way? I did really enjoy when I first started messing around with these recipes in the South was being able to go to people who I'd known for years and were very, very against just like general vegan cooking or like, I need my meat. and. <laughs> being able to come up with something and feed it to them and have them actually enjoy it and be able to go like, okay, this didn't come from a dead animal, but I'm actually enjoying my meal. Alcabalon's mother, who is also a vegetarian, taught them how to cook. And there were always tons and tons of cookbooks all over my household. They loved working with seitan and started developing a line of plant-based meats after college. But in 2019, a new law was proposed in Mississippi that changed Alcabalon's career path. I'd already been devising recipes to move somewhere else for quite a while, and then the Mississippi legislature decided they were going to introduce a bill that would actually ban the labeling of any plant-based product as any kind of meat. While the law ultimately was halted in court, it was a signal for Al Cabalon to pack their bags and head west. Why did you choose Portland? So I actually had a marvelous opportunity here. So I started off in Portland in a vegan food pod. So it was like supposed to be the first vegan food pod to appear in the US. That pod was Shady Pines Food Court, the country's first all vegan food cart park that opened in early 2020. While Shady Pines shuttered a year later, it helped introduce Alcabalon's food to the city's vibrant culinary community. I was definitely very well received and I got to be part of the publicity of like a vegan food pod, all vegan. One year after launching their cart, Alcabalon was able to open a brick and mortar spot in 2021. Here, the chef experiments with new seitan meat swaps for Southern staples like pork ribs and catfish. I think in a lot of restaurants, if you go and order three different things made of seitan, you're going to get roughly the same seitan prepared in different ways. But I actually make a point to have like a completely different protein blend for each different fake meat that I do. Speaking of all this food, I'm starving. I'm mm -hmm. not gonna lie, I caught a glimpse of that fried chicken and I think I might need it. Ooh, how about if we get back to this kitchen? <laughs> I'm ready, let's do it. All right. <laughs> Make your iconic fried chicken out of seitan. Can you tell me about what seitan is and how you make this delicious chicken? 
Oh yeah, so seitan is, essentially it is pure, it is a mass of pure wheat gluten protein. Actually you would make it by just like taking regular wheat flour and washing it and until you have like a sticky protein left over. But these days you can just buy like the dehydrated gluten on its own, which is what we have here, mixed with a whole bunch of different spices. Alcabalon adds a liquid mixture to the wheat gluten. This is the secret behind the different meat textures. Yeah, and the idea that depending on how much like oil, fat, and water you have in your wet blend, you're gonna end up with a different final product of your seitan. The next step is similar to making bread. The seitan and liquid mixture are kneaded together. Like it doesn't feel like dough. Yeah. You know, it feels like, like something that has a lot more texture and, and pull to it. Yeah, the weird pseudo dough. Yeah, it's very much a pseudo dough. <laughs> The dough transforms into seitan after simmering in veggie stock. After the seitan cools, it's cut into fillets and soaked overnight. Then the seitan is ready to be breaded and fried. Here is the chicken. A major thing for me with all my seitan is I try to deliberately make them as irregular as possible. Because mm. if you get like an actual piece of meat from an animal, it's not going to be it's a uniform perfect. disc. Right, yeah. right. The process starts with a healthy sprinkle of cayenne. Then, just like a regular dredge, it's covered in flour and a secret spice mix. The egg-free wet mixture is where things really get interesting. Oh yeah, so this is just a blend of mustard, water, a little bit of cornstarch, and my house spice blend. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mustard, why mustard? You'll see it sometimes in like old southern fried chicken recipes, yeah, but it's yeah. not nearly as common as you'll see just like your standard egg or buttermilk wash. It's not as much a flavor thing, it's like a texture thing. Mustard is kind of acidic in a way that reacts with your breading. So yeah, going from there, we get right over into our second dry bath. Oh. And from oh. here, we get pretty weird with it. This is where we're actually building that texture of the chicken by hand. How do you do that? You just kind of... Yeah, so we start by just sort of coating chicken, coating our breading on there, getting a nice pasty, goopy mix. So yeah, that's how it's like, that looks like very rough and all over the place, but that's roughly what a piece of chicken is gonna look like before we fry it. Wow. It's like very rough, very lumpy. Yeah, well, check that out. Oh, how cool. <laughs> do you trust me to make one? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we get these into some oil. Okay, oh yes, let's do it. The seitan chicken fries in canola oil until it's golden brown. Oh, I yeah. loved my fried chicken, and then I went plant-based, and I never had fried chicken, so this oh, is yeah. an exciting that, That's moment. my goal, it's like let people have all the tasty things yeah. they growing up and not yeah. feel guilty about it. Oh, yeah. We're probably looking? just about ready to Pull this up. That is looking pretty happy. That's definitely like the go-to signature is just getting those proper flakes. Wait, do you hear this? You got that? I think you eat with all of your senses, right? Okay, mm -hmm. cheers. Cheers. All right, going for it. Stop. <laughs> like, I know you know this is good, but. That's usually the response I go for. <laughs> it's so well, good. <laughs> the, like, Oh my god, I can't even speak. The breading is insane. It literally tastes like chicken. One of the things I realized as I started messing with more and more vegan meats is that a lot of what people associate with a lot of traditional meats that they've eaten is not actually the protein itself, but just the way it's prepared. Right. <laughs> Cheers, this is delicious. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for joining. But as delicious as Al Cable on Seitan is, their bigger goal is making vegan food more approachable. How do you think that you're making vegan food more equitable? A lot of people, it's like vegan food in general, I think is still a bit overpriced in most markets. Well, honestly, a big thing for me is I try to make sure that if I offer any product on my menu and make sure I can provide people with like a big hefty portion size and not charge them $35 for one meal. <laughs> Up next, a Brooklyn sweet shop that's ditching the dairy and creamy cheesecake.
Simply Sweet, a vegan dessert shop in Brooklyn, specializes in raw desserts. That means nothing on the menu is heated above 104 degrees, so you won't find any ovens in here. Opened in 2019, Simply Sweet makes treats that are free from gluten and refined sugar. You'll find anything here to satisfy a sweet tooth, from chocolate bars to creamy cakes and fruity acai bowls. Because I love sweets, everything's sweet, I love desserts and caramel and fruits, everything sweet. <laughs> Alessia Mirpocheyeva is the owner and head pastry chef. She moved to the US from Russia in 2012. After landing in New York, Alessia quickly got her start in the food industry at Juice Press, then a fast-growing smoothie and organic food chain with a celebrity following. I fell in love with their food and smoothies and juices. And when I got there, it was like, different world because um, I've never heard about some ingredients like maca powder, goji berries. I'm like, what? <laughs> Alessia also worked as a line cook at a private school in Manhattan. That's where she truly fell in love with cooking, whipping up delicious baked goods for the students. When Alessia became a mother a few years ago, she decided to start an eatery of her own. Can you tell me about why you started Simply Sweet? When I was pregnant, I was thinking how I'm gonna feed my baby when he's born. And when he uh, was growing up, and then he started to uh, pick food from my plate, I thought <laughs> I'm gonna give him a piece of broccoli, but when I look into my plate, I see like slice of pizza, <laughs> you know, with sausage, pepperoni, lots of cheese. I'm like, like no. I don't wanna feed my kid this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I realized um, I have to start um, from myself, to change myself, change my everyday eating habits so I can be an example for my son. Her first step, lots and lots of research. I'm not a professional chef, so I'm self-taught. And um, I go to Google every time <laughs> when I have a question. I took some courses about chocolate, how to make chocolate at home, how to make raw vegan desserts and vegan desserts, not only raw. Yeah, I use Instagram a lot because I follow bloggers and recipe creators. I always uh, try stuff at home. I love to feed my family and hear their feedback, good feedback. After three years of running Simply Sweet, being a mom is still Alessia's top priority. And uh, I have a son, he's almost six years old and he likes my dessert. He's a big fan of chocolate. He likes chocolate truffles, chocolate cake. <laughs> so I try to keep him healthy. You must be the most popular mom in town. Like, do you bake everyone's cake uh, or no bake? I keep saying bake, <laughs> but really there's no baking involved. I don't know. I would say <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm pretty famous here. <laughs> I had to learn the secrets behind Alessia's unique treats. So she taught me how to make her favorite item on the menu, lemon blueberry cheesecake. It's super easy and literally everybody can make it at home. You're not dealing with an oven. You're sticking no. it in the freezer, you're letting it set. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. It. Yeah, it's like low maintenance as well. Yeah. First, the hazelnuts go in, then shredded coconut, and my favorite sugar alternative, dates. I love dates. It's like a part of my life. <laughs> and too, brand. Yeah. The mixture is blended in a food processor for two to three minutes. So, what should the texture be like? You know, when we know it's done. Yeah. Uh, it usually changes the color. Okay. And it's like. A little darker. Wet. Yeah. The pie crust is then firmly pressed into a mold. The sticky dates help bind the raw ingredients while the base freezes for about 15 minutes. The crust is in our freezer. Yeah. What are we going to do next? Uh, so now we are going to make our cheese part. First in, soaked and drained raw cashews. Soaking the cashews makes them easier to blend and ensures a creamy, smooth consistency. Our house made coconut milk. I love that you make your own coconut milk. So how do you make it? Uh, we just mix coconut butter and filtered water. Coconut butter. Nothing Ooh. else. Yeah. I love that, very minimal. Next up, maple syrup, vanilla extract, lemon juice, and melted coconut oil. Okay, so you've yeah. melted and cooled that? Yeah. Okay. It's already melted and we use coconut oil so it stay firm. Mm. And when you um, take the cake out of freezer, it doesn't fall apart. The mixture is blended until it's totally smooth with no lumps. Can you believe this creamy filling is completely vegan? Okay, it's perfect. So now we're gonna put it in the freezer for like an hour. Okay. And then we're gonna uh, do our blueberry layer. Amazing. Yeah. See you later. 
To the remaining cashew mixture, we add frozen blueberries and then blend again. With the fruit, the mix transforms into a stunning purple. Love it. beautiful. Very this creamy. Color. It's so pretty. Wait, we have to show them this color. Sure. Check this out, everyone. Look at that. The first layer freezes for an hour before adding the blueberry flavored cream. Alessia was prepared with a fully frozen, half finished cheesecake for me to polish off. Gorgeous. And then to the freezer it goes? Yeah, to the freezer for about five hours. Okay. Then, and then it will be ready. And it'll be worth it. Those yeah. five hours will be worth it. <laughs> All right. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait five hours. So this is how it looks like. Yay! It's so pretty. And we're gonna unmold it. Okay. After unmolding, the cheesecake gets a final decoration. Shavings of Alessia's house-made chocolate. So how long would you wait for it to thaw before you start slicing it to serve? Uh, we will leave it at room temperature on the table for okay. about 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. And then we can cut it. Well, luckily, you're very prepared. You have slices yeah. for us. So can we taste? Yes, yeah, sure, of course. I'm so excited. Here we go. Look how pretty they are. <laughs> <gasps> this spoon is really fun. Wow. Mm. It's so delicious. You know, cake is such a comfort food for so many people, and a lot of people don't think they can have this healthier, delicious, decadent options. What are your favorite customer reactions from people who maybe haven't tried this before? Most of them don't realize um, our dessert doesn't have eggs and flour, and they're like, Wow, Yeah, <laughs> they can't believe it. This is so fun to make it and I will be eating this and taking it with me. So okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. With innovative techniques and lots of imagination, modern chefs are turning classic meals and treats into plant-based comfort foods everyone can enjoy. I mean, I was almost going to wear a yellow dress. That would have been a lot of turmeric. Oh, that would have been set. cute. We would have really, like, <laughs> we would have been, like, real turmeric champions. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Turmeric, or haldi in Hindi or Urdu, is prized for its golden yellow hue and the warm, earthy aroma it imparts to a variety of recipes. It has a rich history in South Asian cuisine and culture, and it's always been a fixture in my own home. Recently, many in the wellness community have also touted turmeric's potential health benefits, often labeling it as a superfood. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about one of my favorite spices. Are there any proven medicinal uses? Whether it's in root form, ground, or dried, how do you keep it fresh? I can't wait to share a comforting dish with turmeric that always transports me back to my mom's kitchen. But first, I want to get to the root of it all, literally. So I'm off to a farm growing turmeric in a surprising place, upstate New York. Growing up, turmeric added beautiful color and wonderful flavor to almost all of the dishes my mom cooked, from her masala veggies to her haldi rice. But she only used it in its dry ground form. I wanted to see just how my family's favorite spice is farmed, and I didn't have to fly all the way to India. Can I give me a little tour? Yeah, I'd love right, to, let's yeah. See About two hours north of New York City is Green Owl Farms in Rhinebeck. Suzanne Kelly converted her home to a working farm in 2013. Here, she grows potatoes, squash, and saffron. But her main crops are aromatics, namely garlic, ginger, and of course, turmeric. The turmeric plant kind of grows like a hand, then it will grow even more fingers right. off of that. Suzanne's love for agriculture began after college when she started growing vegetables. From graduate school in Florida to teaching at SUNY New Paltz, she never stopped gardening. What was your journey to getting to this point? I was an academic for a little over 10 years, yep, teaching women's gender and sexuality studies. And I was sort of longing to do something else. I had a big rambling garden and I was thinking a lot about agriculture at that time. Yeah. 
I just sort of decided to take the leap. Suzanne's home sits on less than an acre, but after some extensive research, she realized she had enough land to turn it into a farm. How did you learn so much about all of this? It's mostly self-taught. Yeah. Just really following what, you know, what the experts have been doing, learning from other farmers. Oh yeah, I never worked on a farm. Suzanne picked garlic, ginger, and turmeric as her main crops for strategic reasons. They can be grown without extra hands and don't need much space to yield enough to sell at farmers markets. They can also easily be dried or ground up for sale during the winter. So give us a little explainer on turmeric. So turmeric is a rhizome that is traditionally used in uh, Southeast Asian, Middle Eastern, Indian cuisine. It's used as a spice. More people are probably familiar with it in its powder form that um, gets all ground up and dehydrated and then put in a jar and then we buy it in the spice rack of our supermarket. Turmeric is native to South Asia, specifically India, known for its warm tropical climate. So how do you grow turmeric in New York? I've been inspired by lots of other small farms that have been doing this in the Northeast for some time over the last, I don't know exactly when they started, but certainly over the last decade. I get my seed from um, from Hawaii. In Asia, there are more than 100 varieties of turmeric. Suzanne grows Indira yellow and Hawaiian red, which fare better in cooler places. You need at least 10 months to be able to grow it to full maturity, at which point it's how you find it in the grocery store, sort of with that hard, um, tough skin on the outside. Suzanne starts growing the delicate seeds in her climate-controlled basement in late February. I visited the farm in early summer to help Suzanne move the baby turmeric outdoors. This is a, about a hundred and I think 120 feet of um, a turmeric bed that we're going to plant. I'm ready. Okay. I've never been more ready. Turmeric, a rhizome, is closely related to ginger. Both have thick green stalks that grow upward above ground. The thick nodes and roots lie in the soil. The nodes, called rhizomes, are what we eat. So we're just going to Loosen the soil like that. I'm gonna stick it in like that. And that's it. Wow. We're gonna do a plant one about four to six inches apart. All right, so I'm so gonna, gonna loosen, loosen it up a bit. Okay. A little deeper. Okay. All right, so going straight in? Yep, straight in. Have fun in there. You did it. Did you see that? Did you see that? Okay. Excellent. Good job. Good job. So I do, am I you hired? really good. You are. I'm you hired. Are. You're okay. hired. Yep. I'm hired. Yep. Yep. Job, yep. Sorry. <laughs> now you just need to do 200 more of them. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe cancel that. <laughs> May not have a new job. By mid October, the young turmeric is ready for harvest. So we pick it young. You're sort of hustling to get it harvest right. before the frost comes because by November, by mid November, you know, you might have snow. It's yeah. possible. With a short growing period before winter sets in, Suzanne picks the roots before the plant reaches full maturity. It has a kind of like fresh, young, kind of yellow, and in some cases red, depending upon the type, type of turmeric, kind of hue to it. Um, and the texture is a little bit different too. It's not as fibrous. It's more sort of like an apple when it's picked young. At the farmer's market where Suzanne sells her produce, she also hands out recipe cards to customers who may be unfamiliar with fresh turmeric. Suzanne, tell me a little bit about your customers' reactions when they see the turmeric. Well, the first reaction is, what is this? <laughs> yes, and then if they know what turmeric is, uh, they'll be like, oh yeah, I take that in a pill form. Right? Like this, a wellness this, angle. Like a wellness angle, yes, that really is about throwing it in your smoothie. Yeah, yeah and I think it's it's important to like educate right on that, on where it comes from. It's so interesting because I, I really have grown up around turmeric for as long as I can remember. Obviously very important in Indian cuisine and medicine and all of that, but I've never planted it. So it's so cool. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to literally put oh, it into the soil. That's it's just, great. It's amazing to have that connection, right, between something that you eat and something that actually grows yeah. from the ground. Yeah.
idea, turmeric's importance runs much deeper than its culinary use. It's a huge part of many traditions and daily life. To learn more about its cultural legacy, I met up with Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya, an MD who also practices Ayurvedic medicine. Her book on Ayurveda details the history and methods used in the ancient holistic practice. What is Ayurveda? It is the longevity, which is Ayush or Ayu. So longevity and how to live well. And Veda, which is the science or the knowingness. The medicine of Ayurveda is that part of not just staying well and being healthy, but also the other side, which is when you're sick, when you're diseased, how to get well. Ayurveda is based on ancient writings that promote whole body wellness through diet, physical activity, and mindful practices. So those of us who practice Ayurvedic medicine focus more on the food as medicine, lifestyle medicine, and medicinal herbs, medicinal oils. But when you say, what is Ayurveda? Ayurveda is just a philosophy. It's not a religion, but it's a philosophy like organic living. We shared a meal at Divya's kitchen in New York City. Divya chefs apply Ayurvedic principles to all of their recipes, and turmeric is used in many of their dishes. This looks so delicious. We've got a Kichdi classic, we've got a cashew curry, and we've got a mung bean soup. In the traditional practice, turmeric is considered anti-inflammatory. It's used to treat a variety of issues, including digestive problems, PMS symptoms, and arthritis pain. And so the golden sense of turmeric goes all the way from being an antimicrobial that protects the body to an anti-inflammatory, and this idea that it really enriches the body. Another use that is not a spice in cooking is what we now today call turmeric latte, which is <laughs> taking milk and putting a teaspoon of turmeric in it yeah. and using that as an anti-inflammatory before bed. Many Ayurvedic health claims are not supported by Western medical experts, but scientists at places like UCLA and John Hopkins are conducting more research. What is sort of that importance of turmeric in Indian culture? Um, it's part of the sacredness of honoring our bodies, yeah. honoring our minds, and it's something that comes from the ground and protects us. There's a lot of cultural aspects of this. So there's Gaye Holud, which is where the bride and groom will have their own family members before marriage cover their whole bodies in turmeric and give them a bath in that. And there's variations of it in different cultures, but having that bath cleanses them, gets them ready. When we were kids, if we ever had a boo-boo, one of the prized things we could show our friends is that mom put some haldi on our boo-boo, right? Instead of a band-aid, you'd go and show that there was this big yellow stained spot. And so the golden sense of turmeric, it really enriches the body. In Ayurveda, turmeric's healing elements make it an essential spice for the whole body and even the mind. But I wanted to learn more about the latest medical research on its purported health benefits.
My family in India uses turmeric in almost every dish for many reasons, in part because they see the spice as a preservative and antiseptic. But recently in the US, turmeric is being hyped as a health supplement. You can find it in pills, powders, and even beauty products. But what does the science really say about its benefits? To learn more about its many uses, I met with spice expert and cookbook author Kanchan Koya, who also happens to have a PhD in biomedicine from Harvard. I'm so excited to talk about all things turmeric with you, but I want to know a little bit more about you. I'm a scientist by training. My lab started to study the health benefits of turmeric in cancer. I had grown up in India where turmeric is just a part and parcel of the everyday and because I had grown up with it, I had kind of rolled my eyes at all the obsessions around it. And then here I was doing my PhD, my lab is studying turmeric and it was a real aha moment for me that a lot of this ancient kind of ancestral wisdom around these spices is bearing fruit when it comes to modern research and I was like, okay, maybe there's something to it. Conscience Lab studied the yellow pigment found in turmeric, curcumin. So curcumin is one of the compounds in turmeric that has been best studied and it's a polyphenol, which is just a certain kind of chemical compound that has effects in our bodies. Conscience research found that curcumin aided in chemotherapy, making it more effective in treating cancerous cells in breast cancer patients. The reason I hesitate to sort of think of curcumin as a cure-all is because we don't have that many randomized clinical trials looking at the effects of curcumin in a whole human. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't have benefits in a whole human, it just means we need more data. Different brands of ground turmeric have vastly different levels of curcumin, but the actual amount of the polyphenol isn't required on food packaging or supplement labels, so it's impossible to know how much you're actually getting. While ground turmeric is readily available in most grocery stores today, the whole root has been growing in popularity as home cooks and wellness devotees learn more about the spice. When I was younger, I never cooked with it fresh, so I was excited to try it in a new way. We're going to be talking all about turmeric, and you're going to show me how to make a fresh turmeric tea. Never used fresh turmeric until I tried this tea when I was traveling in Vietnam. Fresh turmeric root isn't widely used in traditional Indian cooking, but it's a staple in Southeast Asian cuisine. So we're starting with fresh turmeric root, and this basically looks like ginger, but once you cut it down the middle, you will see it is very different. I think it looks really pretty, thinly sliced, so I'm just going to make some thin slices and rings. Are there any benefits to using fresh overground? So, you know, it's not a simple, um, this is better than that. I would say in a perfect world, you should incorporate both. Turmeric powder is rich in vitamin C and B6, plus it contains magnesium and iron. From a culinary perspective, they're very unique. The fresh um, has this sort of more vibrant, zesty kind of vibe, whereas the dry is definitely earthier, a little bit more bitter, and really amenable to adding to things like curries, soups, vegetables, whereas this is really nice in teas, broths, soups, and smoothies. Okay, so what are we adding in next? Okay, so next up we're going in with ginger. So next up is lemongrass, which I think just adds a really beautiful flavor and almost like a grassy note. Are we boiling this to the max? I like to boil the water, turn it off, and then add the turmeric and let it steep. And that's because I'm trying to preserve some of those essential oils that are really, really rich in the fresh turmeric. The turmeric tea needs about five minutes to steep. Our tea is hanging out, it's steeping, it's having a good time. I have so many questions for you about all things turmeric. So let's talk through all of these different varieties. There's actually so many. So here we have the Roma turmeric, which you can see is really, really vibrant orange. It's the one we used in our tea. Next, the yellow and mango varieties of turmeric both have a lighter color and a more delicate flavor. This is crazy, I've never seen this before. And it's a slightly different turmeric varietal. There's a lot of chefs, especially here in New York, that absolutely love blue turmeric because of this pine menthol flavor. Does it add color though? So I think um, it's very subtle, the color. Yeah. It's not as much, obviously, as the other ones. Whole dried turmeric root can be grated into dishes. It adds a unique brightness compared to the powdered spice. 
What are your tips for buying turmeric from the store? So my first tip is to buy it from a reputable spice brand and not from an open spice market. I love open spice markets, but we do have some disturbing evidence now that sometimes turmeric can be laced with heavy metals, specifically lead chromate to make it look more vibrant. Buy it where there is a clear package date and an expiration date so that you can at least know when it was packaged. So what about fresh turmeric? How do we store that? I would treat it just like you would ginger. So you would buy your fresh turmeric, put it in your fridge, maybe for like a week to 10 days. And if you want to store it longer, I would put it in the freezer. It's actually very easy to grate. A common cooking technique in Indian cuisine is blooming turmeric in hot oil and pairing it with black pepper. This helps bring out the flavor of both spices. So talk to me about the relationship between black pepper and curcumin. And is that a myth? Totally should be doing that. So curcumin, which is the main bioactive in turmeric, is obviously packed with benefits, but unfortunately isn't very well absorbed by the body. It's rapidly cleared by the liver. You really want to improve that bioavailability, as we call it, and you can do that by pairing it with black pepper. And that's because black pepper has a compound called piperin, which can reduce that clearance of the curcumin by the liver. In Western medicine, there have been few studies with limited participants conducted about the interaction between ground turmeric and black pepper. But Conchin says the research looks promising. I've learned so much, and now I'm very excited to drink some tea. Is it ready? It's ready. It's been steeping for a good five to eight minutes, Yay. so we're ready to pour. Let's drink it. So this is almost ready to drink, and the reason I say almost is because of the pepper point that we just covered. So if you really want to bring out those health benefits, especially from the turmeric, just a little dash of black pepper is Ooh. all you need. And finally, we want to add a little drop of a healthy fat, and that's because Pepper will improve the bioavailability of the curcumin, but so will a fat source. And I'm just going in with a very tiny drizzle of olive oil. Ooh. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Okay. Isn't it lovely? It's so vibrant and like zesty. It's but vibrant. But also not overwhelming at all. Right. I love learning how to make this. So thank you. Say turmeric. Turmeric. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to use turmeric in one of my favorite ways, kichdi. Kichdi goes by many names in India, from kichari to kichari to kejari. Every region in the country has a unique version, but it's usually made with lentils, rice, and turmeric. And like any popular comfort food, every family has their own spin on the dish. My mom didn't really make a stew, but her combo of light and fluffy rice with lentils was always one of my favorite meals. Something that's really important to know when you're cooking lentils and rice is that it's really important to rinse and soak them before cooking. Rinsing helps get rid of any debris in the rice or the lentils, and then soaking them will allow it to cook faster. And now I'm just going to drain the water before I start cooking. Uh, 
I'm just gonna add enough water to completely cover the rice and lentils so that we can cook it properly. This is roughly four to five cups of water, but I just want you to make sure that you're covering the rice and lentils completely. Now we're gonna add turmeric, our star. We can't have kitchidi without it. It's gonna add that nice golden color and it's delicious. So I'm gonna cook the lentils and the rice until it's completely mushy. I want it to be really soft. The lentils cook for 30 to 35 minutes. While this is coming to a boil, I'm gonna start prepping my veggies. The best part about kitchidi is that you can really sub in your favorite veggies. I'm using carrots, zucchini, and sweet potatoes, but green beans are also really nice here. You know, I really like to be a vegetable artiste. Uh, but you can cut your veggies however you want. My lentils and rice, they've come to a boil. I'm gonna move it to my back burner on a simmer, and I'm gonna bring my steaming basket over here so I can start steaming my veggies. I let the veggies steam for about 10 minutes until fork tender. Time to chop up my aromatics. First, a rough dice for my onion. Then, just peel and grate fragrant ginger. My veggies are done, I'm gonna move them to my stove top and then get to work on sauteing my aromatics. Now that my pan is hot, I'm gonna go ahead and add my coconut oil. Once the oil starts to shimmer, I'm gonna go ahead and add my cumin seeds. I'm adding whole cumin seeds to the oil to allow the cumin seeds to bloom, extract that delicious flavor. But you know it's ready when the cumin seed starts to sizzle and bubble. You only want this to go for about 15 to 30 seconds. You don't want the oil to burn. Then you're going to go ahead and add your onions. That's the sound we like. We're cooking these onions on medium heat until they're tender and translucent about 3 to 4 minutes. And now I'm going to go ahead and add my grated ginger. I'm going to cook this for a couple minutes with the ginger. We're going to add some salt and pepper. I gotta clean my workstation so we can assemble our kitcheny and take this off the heat. Check out the rice and lentils. <gasps> now is the time where everyone becomes friends. White shirt, risky. <laughs> I'm gonna turn my stove on, cook the lentils and rice with the onions for about two to three minutes and then I'll go ahead and add my veggies, cook everything together and then we'll be done. I'm ready to serve myself a bowl of kitchidi. I've been waiting for this moment for a very long time. I finished my kitchidi with some fresh cilantro and freshly ground black pepper. Take a quick picture, send it to my mom, who I hope will be very proud of me. I think I got the shot. Now I get to eat. The best part, obviously. Oh, it's so good. Cheers. It's so good. It's very nostalgic for me too. What else can I say? It's cute, it's comforting, it's kitschy. That should go on a shirt. I have a bit of a kitschy lunch date. I'm gonna be joined by nutritionist Sarika Shah who's gonna talk to me about all things turmeric and kitschy. Can't wait. Sarika, it's so nice to meet you. I have been very excited about our kitschy date. I just made some. Um, can you talk to me first about your family's kitchen recipe? Because I know, you know, depending on where you're from in India, everyone makes it a little bit different. I use my mom's recipe. Um, it's a one-to-one -one dal and basmati rice ratio. But something slightly different my mom does is add um, spinach to it. Sarika Shah, AKA the Indian nutritionist on Instagram, is a registered dietitian. She's been practicing for more than 20 years. Her goal is to teach Indian Americans how to eat traditional dishes in a healthier way. She also happens to know a lot about turmeric. What are the nutritional benefits of turmeric that have maybe actually been backed up by science? Are there any? So um, science is still studying turmeric, but turmeric claims to treat skin disorders, upper respiratory infections, any ache and pain essentially. Um, and that comes from Ayurvedic medicine. So does science back it up? There's limited studies, subjects of 40 to about 120, but I have seen studies with a thousand, but that's really not enough to give me the science backing to say, yes, this is exactly what it proves and this is what it does. But the studies are positive, so I think there should be more studies done. So with that being said, do you include turmeric as an element of your recommendations for clients at all? Um, no. Turmeric as a capsule or curcumin, which is the compound out of turmeric that is also glorified. So I don't recommend that. I'm very cautious about that because FDA 
regulations are not stringent on supplements. Is it laced with lead? Is it have other products in it? So um, if you want to include turmeric, the only way I will ever tell people is included in your food in the powder form. So tell me about how you feel about Indian food and turmeric as well coming to the forefront of food and culture. Especially in the U.S. That Indian food is coming up to the forefront, that it's being appreciated as healthier food, um, as something good. And I think that's great for the generations growing up. When I grew up, I would never bring Indian food to lunch. I wouldn't be caught dead with that. Um, <laughs> because the smell or the color or people staring at me. But if it's now something that they claim as like a lentil soup, which is actually our dal with rice, no one's going to bat eyelashes at it. I think it's when we glamorize it and we try to make large doses of it and make it something bigger than it really is, is where the risk comes in. But if we take it for as it is and the way we've used it for thousands of years in our culture, I think it's perfect and it's great. Turmeric is definitely the golden child of spices. Its warming aroma and Ayurvedic properties have been staples in India for centuries. As more research is conducted on its health benefits, there's no doubt that this spice's popularity will continue to rise. But turmeric's cultural significance should never be ignored. It's so Perfect. beautiful, and it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No eggs. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Incredible edible eggs really are, well, pretty incredible. From a simple hard-boiled egg to a stunning souffle, Eggs are essential parts of so many meals. They give great lift to pastry, make dishes super decadent, and they're also just delicious on their own. But how do you replace them in a plant-based diet? I'm going on a cross-country hunt to find out how chefs are cooking up savory meals and sweets, all without cracking a single egg. Right now, it's breakfast time. So I'm headed to a local spot right here in Brooklyn that's turning chickpea flour into a breakfast staple, the perfect scramble. Hi, Sama. Amanda. Nice, so nice to, to meet you. Amanda. Nice to meet you, Cheyenne. Cheyenne, nice to meet you. So excited to be here. Should yeah. we get inside? Let's do it. Let's, Let's go. go for it. Awesome. Cheyenne Willis and Amanda Fox own and operate Satan's Helper in Brooklyn, New York. The couple, who wed in 2016, dish up vegan twists on classic New York City deli dishes. Their specialty? Remaking breakfast staples with a variety of plant based eggs. A lot of people, when they go plant-based or they try and start eating a more vegan diet, right? Mm -hmm. Eggs are something that people seem to miss. So you do a lot of really interesting things with eggs here. And I want to know, how do you mimic the texture and the flavor of a regular egg? Tofu just is never going to be <laughs> eggs, so you just have to get <laughs> to that closeness. Yeah. So with our tofu scramble, Cheyenne uses a process of doing three different kinds of uh, tofu. So they'll do one block of tofu in cubes, so you get that like little cube aspect. They blend some aspect to make it creamy, and then some they mash with their hands. So you get like a different sort of a scramble, like a creamy scramble with like little bits of bite to it. From tofu scrambles to a chickpea-based omelet, there's no shortage of creative plates here. There's a lot of different avenues you can take with plant-based food, right? So why did you choose a vegan deli? We're both from Pennsylvania. We both come from like getting your sandwich from the grocery store. And it's just like a classic nostalgic feeling. I grew up cooking with my grandparents and my mom, and it was just always classic Americana food. So we decided that this would be the most natural road for us to take. Um, and this is just what came naturally to us. Amanda and Cheyenne first met during high school in Pennsylvania. A few years after graduation, they reconnected and quickly fell in love over their shared passion for cooking. We've just been always obsessed with food. Cheyenne's actually a classically trained pastry chef. The two moved to Brooklyn and worked together at several restaurants across New York City. 
they tied the knot at Dunwell, a vegan donut shop in Williamsburg. What is your favorite part about working with Cheyenne? We're in each other's brains, 100%. <laughs> After working in traditional restaurants, they both had dreams of creating a more equitable eatery, run with a focus on treating staff fairly. So we decided that when we made our space that it would be everybody's on the same plane. Equal. It doesn't matter who technically owns it, it doesn't matter who does what or whatever. Everybody gets paid the same, we all are just here working together as a team. In 2018, Amanda and Cheyenne started running a vegan pop-up, serving homemade seitan at various locations around Brooklyn. Seitan, the restaurant's namesake, is a high-protein meat substitute made from wheat gluten. The chefs use seitan to recreate plant-based deli meats, like bacon and roast beef. I think the interesting thing about our food is we base it on those flavors that you're so used to. So when we were coming up with our salami recipe, I was like, okay, so what goes into actual salami? And we took those ideas and those flavors, so it became the base for this nostalgic food that we can now make vegan. After a successful run, the pop-up graduated to a storefront in 2020. Putting down roots in a permanent location was vital for the couple, who wanted to create an inclusive space for vegan and queer communities. We get to meet so many different types of people, and obviously because we're a queer-owned company, we attract all the queers, which is perfect with me. We have our loyal customers that have been with us from the jump. The same person who ordered from my very first pop-up came in the other day. I was certainly ready for my breakfast sandwich. Cheyenne took me into the kitchen to make a Satan's Helper signature. All right, so what are we making first, Cheyenne? So we're gonna start with the nomlet. It's our chickpea flour-based egg. You say nomlet? Nomlet, Like yes. nom nom. Absolutely. I love that. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna start with some chickpea flour here. Okay. To make a perfect nomlet, building the right eggy texture is key. Cheyenne mixes oat milk, lemon juice, and oil with chickpea flour, or besan, a common ingredient in Indian cuisine. Have you tested this with other flours, or have you landed on chickpea flour being the best for I an eggy? I definitely try with regular flour, but it is weird. So that's why we use the chickpea, just okay. keep it like lighter, fluffier, okay. less harsh. It looks really nice, it smells good already. Yeah. A few simple spices amp up the flavor and color of the dish. A lot of spices in here to Tons. make it nice and nomlety. Yeah, <laughs> delicious. I feel that uh, a lot of times in vegan cooking, people don't add a lot of spices. Cheyenne's secret to upping the savory factor is kala namak, or Himalayan black salt, which comes from North India. It adds this, so this really nomlet. <laughs> wonderful um, sulfuric acid taste and brings that egg flavor really to the that front. That egginess, yeah. 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 The nomlet cooks for about five minutes before getting a flip. Look at that. Stunning. Gorgeous. Yeah. So we'll know when she's done, when she's a little bit firm. Okay. Yeah, she's pretty much good to go. This looks really good and it smells amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. It's like, it's such, it's giving me such a savory pancake vibe, mm -hmm. even though it is also an omelet, so I love it. The omelet is served with even more plant-based breakfast staples. All right, so All right. I have our housemate. The bacon. Bacon here. This is made out of seitan, I'm It assuming. is, and there's like oats and cheese, Ooh. jalapenos, a bunch of wow. fun stuff in here. We do not skimp on anything. Love that. And so I fried this up, and we're just gonna lay this gently down. Amazing. Just give it a little bit of fluff there. Love it. And then we would just close the lid up. Ta-da, a totally vegan BEC. Here I go. Woo! Whoa. Whoa, Cheyenne, whoa. Lots of flavors. The omelet is crispy. The bacon is super flavorful. It's delicious. Thank you. The eggless egg sandwich really blew me away. Now it's time for lunch, and I happen to know a fantastic ramen spot on the other side of the country.
Among the countless ramen spots out there, Ramen Hood in downtown Los Angeles is truly something special. Everything on the menu is totally vegan. Ramen Hood was co-founded by Top Chef Season 2 winner Ilan Hall and world-renowned chef Rahul Kapkar in 2015. There you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited. Ramen Hood is one of just a few restaurants in the country specializing in plant-based ramen. And they were the first to offer a vegan soft-boiled egg, a traditional topping for this comforting soup. Rahul, you yes. make vegan ramen. Can you tell me about why you do that and how this all got started? Uh, it was actually my friend's idea. I was working in Denmark at the time, and he called me and he was like, hey, I have this idea for a vegan noodle concept. That friend was Ilan, who had been running Esh, an Israeli barbecue joint in Brooklyn. Why make it vegan? <laughs> My business partner had a restaurant that was very meat heavy, and he was catching a lot of flack from vegans on Twitter. <laughs> and that is kind of, it's not like the catalyst, but he was just kind of like, all right, well, I mean, I can do vegan food. In 2014, Elon invited Rahul to cross the Atlantic and bring his expertise from one of the world's most prestigious fine dining restaurants, Noma in Copenhagen. Part of the reason he called me was because the restaurant I was working at, we were serving, I think, like 24 courses at the time, and like 16 of them were vegetable forward. And then once we kind of started talking about it and refining it, it just made sense for us to do ramen. Ramen's something I grew up eating. It's like a real, uh, kind of like comfort food for me and definitely nostalgic. I used to come home from school and have a bowl with my grandmother. Traditional ramen broth is usually made with pork, beef, or chicken bones. Sometimes it's a combo. But Ramen Hood uses vegan dashi, a liquid base made from kanbu and shiitake mushrooms. This is a spicy garlic sunflower seed broth. Uh, we've got some bean sprouts in here, baby bok choy, uh, king oyster mushrooms, scallions, sesame seeds, chili thread. After pressure cooking and blending the ingredients with sunflower seeds, the chefs are able to create a creamy, umami-rich broth without any animal protein. But Rahul thought their vegan bowls wouldn't be complete without a classic topping, a creamy, soft-boiled egg. Why was it important for you to add this vegan egg into um, this ramen? People expect an egg in ramen. It provides that creamy texture that kind of people are looking for. And in like a traditional bowl, it can be a really nice, like different thing to be eating. Like you've got chewy noodles and you've got this pork and then, you know, you've got an egg that's like a soft boiled egg. It just makes the, the broth richer and it kind of makes your entire experience eating the bowl feel richer. Ramen Hood's secret? Mixing the dashi from their ramen broth with agar, a gelatin made from seaweed. Teach me how to make this. Yeah, this is pretty straightforward. So we're gonna take 500 grams of our broth. Okay. This is the agar here. We're just gonna put a little bit in. Dump this in here. So I'm stirring this around to make sure the agar doesn't clump and settle. Okay. How long does it take to get to the point where you want it to be? Um, not long. It'll take a, just a couple minutes. After the agar mixture simmers, it's poured into a custom mold to create an egg shape. How many of these do you make a day? Uh, about 150. Within just a few minutes, the liquid firms up, and it looks and feels just like a boiled egg white. This literally tastes like, first of all, this tastes so good. It tastes like ramen broth, like a lot of umami, but also the texture is very egg white. Yeah, because it's this just the broth. Way it's, better. Like, it's got the richness from the sunflower seeds. Yeah. To make a whole egg, the chef uses a melon baller to scoop out room for the yolks. That's so crazy how like gelatinous it is. Like a egg white. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna go. Don't judge me. First time. That was pretty good. That was better than most people's first try. When the egg whites are firm, it's time to fill them with the creamy yolk. It's vegan mayo with food coloring and black salt. Like okay. Indian black Call salt. Enema, yeah. yeah, so it's got the uh, egg flavor to it. Okay, yeah. cool. And you so, just pipe it in? Yeah. Here. Yeah. That's it. 
just I'm go. like looking for my affirmation. Just, just go to, yeah, just do the rest of it. There you go. This jiggly, soft-boiled egg helps complete a ramen experience that hasn't been available to many vegan foodies for years. Okay, I'm going for the egg. I feel like I owe it to us to go for the egg. I think you should just one bite it. Wow, it's so good. I just, I truly haven't had ramen in years because I mostly can't eat it anywhere. So this is revolutionary for my life. Like, this is a plot twist for me. I love it. I'm coming back. I'm bringing my parents next time. This vegan hard-boiled egg might be pretty advanced for a home chef, but I've got a super easy egg swap for baked goods that only requires two ingredients. If you're looking to replace eggs in your baked goods, maybe you're allergic, you're vegan, or you simply don't like eggs, a flax egg might be the substitute for you. I'm gonna show you how to make two flax eggs today. So we're using two tablespoons of flaxseed meal with five tablespoons of warm water. You can see it right here. This is gonna blow your mind. It's super simple. Grab your flaxseed meal, add it to a bowl, clean bowl. And next, I'm just gonna add my warm water. I know, it's challenging, right? We wanna give this a nice little stir, get everything nice and incorporated. All of the flax should get in there. We're gonna let this sit aside for about five minutes until it gets nice and thick and gelatinous. After, you can use it as a sub for your eggs and your baked goods. So I'm just gonna let it hang out. It's gonna chill out, have some spa time. See you soon. Welcome back. It's been five minutes while I waited for my flax egg to do its thing. You wanna wait until it's nice and gelatinous. So that might take you a couple extra minutes, no worries. Let's check the texture. Check this out. She's thick, gelatinous, I keep saying that word, but it's true. Flax eggs really work like eggs to help bind and thicken your baked good. It's not gonna rise exactly like eggs would, but you're not gonna taste it at all. It's still gonna be a delicious and perfectly baked, baked good. I'm not saying this belongs in a museum, but it might belong in your cookies, okay? Flaxseed isn't the only swap vegan bakers can use to replace eggs. One bakery in Portland is using all sorts of different ingredients, from applesauce to tofu, to make plant-based desserts that are totally decadent.
When it comes to pastry and baked goods, eggs are pretty egg central. They definitely help bind things together in baking. They provide moisture. They have some fat and protein, which just provide the structure for the baked good, you know, for it to, to rise, they give lift. So they are really hard to replace. This is Lisa Clark, the founder of Petunias, Portland's first all vegan and gluten-free bakery. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming in. She's also an expert in egg-free baking. It really depends on the product that we're making and the qualities that each egg substitute has and what you want the end result to be like. And the other ingredients that are in the recipe, you know, it has to work well with what you're making. We use a lot of coconut yogurt, which gives a lot of moisture and it helps make things a little lighter. Applesauce also does help to give moisture um, and a little bit of lift. And chia seed meal, I love, and it's very healthy for you, which is added bonus. We use this like in our chocolate chip cookie. It works really well in cookies to help bind things together and give a nice texture. This is silken tofu that's pureed with a, a milk, so you could use coconut milk, almond milk, rice milk with an immersion blender. That's really nice in like a pound cake that we make or a poppy seed muffin that we make. It helps give some structure and stability. In 2003, Lisa learned she was intolerant to dairy, gluten, and eggs. She decided to take control of her diet by turning to one of her favorite childhood hobbies. My mom is who taught me how to bake, and it's just something we did together all the time. She had ALS when I was a child, and she passed away when I was 12, um, which was really, really hard, and so there wasn't a lot that we could do together because she was so limited physically she was in a wheelchair and I was the youngest of three and I was home with her all the time and helped take care of her um, and one thing she could do was just explain to me how to bake and tell me what to do and I would have our little KitchenAid mixer and you know follow the directions and get up on my stool and do it and I loved it and it's one thing that we could do to bond and to do something together. She had a little ceramic pig's head that hung over the stove when I was a kid and her name was Petunia the pig and so when I was trying to think of a business name I remember the pig who's at my dad's house and I thought that's perfect Petunia. Lisa adopted her mom's recipes to be gluten-free and vegan. It took her months of experimenting before she was finally ready to start selling her baked goods. I remember when I started doing this I I really didn't have doubt. I knew that it was gonna go well and I knew that there were other people like me that had dietary restrictions or lived a different lifestyle and that there was um, a niche to fill. Petunia's pies and pastries started as a booth at Portland's Farmer's Market in 2009. Lisa's cowgirl cookies, pecan sticky buns, and gorgeous cupcakes immediately appealed to people with various food allergies. Every week, every day I would go set up my, do my whole setup, set up my table, my booth, and get out there and there were so many people that would come wait in line like down the whole farmers market for I don't know how long I would have people come and just be in, in tears because they haven't been able to eat like a donut for 20 years or something or you know kids come with food allergies um, and moms crying because they can't find a cupcake for them and now they can have a cupcake and um, that makes me emotional <laughs> It's awesome to see that gluten-free, vegan, dairy-free, egg allergy, whatever it is, we can accommodate these people and make everyone feel special and everyone feel included and just bring joy to everybody that we can. Petunias has expanded over the last decade. They have a bakery in downtown Portland and a national wholesale business. It's a family affair to keep things running. Lisa's husband, Jacob Williamson, is a former barista. He manages all things coffee in the bakery. Her sister, Erica Clark, runs the wholesale business and the company's social media accounts. But I'm here to learn all about Lisa's innovative egg substitutes. I'm really interested to know how you landed on all of these different egg subs. How did yeah. you figure all of this out? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know how I figured it out. Actually, I think just a lot of practice and mm -hmm. testing recipes over and over and you change one thing every time <laughs> so you end up eating a lot of like wasted pastries. Yeah. But, but eventually you arrive at this is the right mix and you find it and you keep it. On the menu today, decadent chocolate cupcakes. What are we doing first? So we're gonna make the chocolate cake batter first. We have our flour blend here right. you can put in there, which has rice flour, 
millet flour, tapioca flour, and flaxseed meal. Wow. And then we have our natural cocoa powder that's sifted. And then we have all of our leavenings and our salt. Can we whisk that. I love a whisk. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of eggs, this batter stays moist thanks to a special squash, pumpkin. It's gonna give it some structure. A lot of um, gluten-free products, especially without the egg too, it can, they can dry out pretty easily, but like the pumpkin and applesauce um, help bind it together, but also they do give a lot of fluff um, and moisture, right. so it works out perfectly. Next in, organic canola oil, coconut milk, sugar, and espresso to really pump up that chocolate flavor. So now we can add the dry ingredients. This looks so amazing. I love batter. It's a struggle to get it to the pan sometimes. Oh yeah, totally. So I came prepared with oh a my spoon gosh. to taste it. Yeah, try it. As Wanna all normal it? people do. Right. right. I love you're prepared. Right. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> we good. That was good. It's crazy because you really don't even need eggs for this. You for really it to taste don't. As delicious. Yeah, you don't. That's the thing. I just there's I feel like you really can make everything without eggs and they're just not necessary, so why not do it a different way? The batter is much thicker than a traditional cake batter, making it super easy to scoop out perfectly even portions. That looks great. Super cute. Perfect. Very yeah. fluffy. It's it is. a very fluffy batter. It is very fluffy, yeah. Why is it so fluffy? It well, I think it's just, I think we just did a really good job. We just did an amazing <laughs> job. We're gonna bake them at 350 in the uh -huh. oven for about 20 to 22 minutes or until um, you put a toothpick in the center and it comes out clean. Now to the most artistic part of baking, decorating. Lisa uses dairy-free butter to make super creamy frosting that also pipes well. This is our salted peanut butter buttercream, which is amazing, ah. it's so good. This is the fun part, and you just have to not worry too much. I always say that cakes and cupcakes can smell fear, so if you're <laughs> hesitant, it's not gonna work out. You try it. I'm going really heavy. You did a great job. Am I hired? It's perfect, okay. yeah, I love it. The cupcakes are topped with melted ganache and torched marshmallows. Bubbling up. <laughs> Voila, a beautiful chocolate cupcake with a plant-based twist. Look at that. It's so Perfect. beautiful. And it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No eggs. Oh my God. <laughs> you know what's crazy is you can't have peanuts. I can't. But I do know someone who can. Yes. Your husband, Jacob. He can, Jacob, yeah. You have to come he share this with loves me. peanut come on. butter. Cupcakes Cheers. Here. This is insane. This is like, this is honestly so delicious. <laughs> so fluffy. <laughs> it's got so much texture and flavor. Truly, if somebody it. gave this to me, I would have no idea that this is a plant-based vegan Good. pastry. Lisa's cupcakes are out of this world, and she says she owes it all to her biggest inspiration. Your mom really started your love for baking, so what does it feel like to open this bakery as a tribute and in honor of her? I know my yeah. mom sees all this, for sure. She's like guardian angel watching over us, helping me along the way, and I know that she would be so proud. Are you ready? Whether you're skipping eggs for an allergy or because you're vegan, there are so many more options now. Culinary innovation is making eggs more accessible to everyone. This then, is crazy. Yeah. This is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants.
And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So, I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom and they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce um, and an apple. You know, they're very different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallhold, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, cremini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's so like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms called pins start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block. About 90% of it is sawdust. Smallhold's mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. 
Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is large, like third party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas. And so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, we have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster. Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. Do you roast the whole thing? I just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off. Pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. And when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Um, which Cause is you can pull it like so yeah, it's almost you can stringy. Pull it. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this, and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. Now, these are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber. They have amazing antioxidants. They have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now.
what got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms. And I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? you Like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for a, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So they are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna, you wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. You don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one. This is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second, we're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> right, so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your you house do and that. do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy-free, soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Sesame yeah. oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get, some, get a good, like, salt in there and then you're just gonna whiskey do dude so this is gonna get I think we have this on medium heat okay okay we have some grapeseed oil here the reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point we're using cast iron you don't have to use cast iron you can use whatever you have um, so we're going um, score side down. down so what's gonna happen we're yeah gonna put them on we're gonna get a good sear on each side and then we're gonna brush our glaze on okay okay two minutes flip it two minutes then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop it <laughs> down. What we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm -hmm. always just like just take flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would we do for I'm sorry, do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to yep. encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, I and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Wait. Look it. Look it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush this on, <laughs> almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh. Come on, baby. 
Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God, you, but except you could do this, but you see I the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, we're gonna be caramelizing, we're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me, too. Uh -huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes, he doesn't need to. Okay. not Nothing trying to, crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's main steaks. It's meaty. Can we show them? <laughs> like, they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like, it almost, it's almost like, like you wouldn't really know. It kind of, it just looks like mm -hmm. chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First, some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. It's mm. so good. Wait, this is, mm. this is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good, I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner to mushrooms, a mm. really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, in mm. this format. Mm. Try cooking them this way. Yeah and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Cause like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's main steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. 
Yeah, it's a right. super meat. <laughs> Where it has all the protein you would yeah. want from meat, but then all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein, Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium. We call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens, right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root, and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom root. I'm gonna you eat know? it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't want to say nothing, because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know. Is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast, really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand, and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient list, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted.
In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? right, right. When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce, Super porous, yeah. soak up anything that you give it. So, best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready. All right, to flip. ready? Yeah. Woo! I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges. All right, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking out right now. Get into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, just... I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my God, I just touched it for the first time too. It's like the the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see, I feel like it has that. But how? <laughs> That's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. Okay, I'm gonna taste it. Should I taste it? This will be your first time, like, yes. stressed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can drop? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken. Literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. Do you need another mic to drop? I need another again? mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm eating. <laughs> I see my book. Yep. This is from my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute. I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> that is a pretty big sandwich. Mm. I'm taking this home. This, wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians. Like something weird is going on here. <laughs> Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true me fashion, we need to take a selfie. So yes. if you don't mind, yes. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special, no, truly. Thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. That's a beautiful